um, individuals as well as those individuals with chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, um, immunocompromised diseases. They should avoid travel to Japan as well. And then today, which is significant, um, the travel advisory is that all Americans should avoid cruise ship travel. So what do we do? And I'm going to repeat what you guys have probably already heard. You don't travel to areas that have um, community transmissions such as China, Iran, South Korea, and Italy. Uh, washing your hands is the best thing. It's actually better than using a sanitizer because sometimes some viruses are not killed by sanitizers. So use, use um, water and soap for 20 seconds. Um, as I mentioned before, the virus has to get into our bodies, and the only way they can get into our bodies is touching our mouths, our eyes, and our noses. Stay home if you're sick. Encourage your employees to stay home. Um, try to allow employees to telecommute if that's a possibility. Keep your kids out of school if they're sick. Um, we're talking about a lot of um, social distancing, so ensuring that if you know, don't know people or people may appear ill, make sure you are six feet away from them. And then if you are coughing or sneezing, make sure you walk away. And then uh, if you are coughing, cough into a tissue, and then make sure you don't leave it on your counter, but you throw it away. So um, we have some information here about who to contact if you need additional information. We have a website, which is www.publichealthlacounty.gov. You can always call 211, which is a 24-hour call line. And then there's other ways that you can get in, uh, in contact with us. I want to also introduce one of my field staff who's here, Lonnie Resser, she can stand up. So um, she's also a resource for you in case you need to get in contact with anyone in my department. So thank you for listening and I can take questions if there are any. Thanks very much for coming. Um, what's the Department of Health's policy, LA County's Department of Health's policy about you know, you hear people, uh, there are confirmed cases, and they maybe, let's say, if they're in somebody's town, what is the policy on releasing that kind of specific information on where the patients are and that kind of thing? I know there's like HIPAA concerns and public panic concerns and things yes. like that. So if you could address that, that would be really helpful. Sure, I can. <laughs> yeah, um, rightfully so. Our communities are really nervous about this, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, it's, it's scary what we're hearing, what we're seeing in the media. Um, and a lot of times we're just saying, wash your hands, but this is a, a, a huge issue. But um, regarding our policy, if an individual is diagnosed or is a contact, uh, that's their private information, and we cannot share that information with others um, because that is a breach of, of HIPAA. So um, if an individual is located in a particular house, community, city, we do not let others know, we do not let elected officials know. But if there are exposure sites, so someone came in with measles or in COVID-19 and we're at Starbucks for a long period of time, we would identify that as an exposure site and we would make sure the public is aware because that is a public health issue. It is not an issue if a person is infected or quarantined in their house and they're not leaving the house um, and they're under um, those orders not to move. It's very different. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And it sounds like what you're talking about is focusing on the uh, potential exposures and vulnerabilities that people may have had if they'd been in those places where that individual with a confirmed case was, as opposed to where they might actually be if they're quarantined. Exactly. It's a public health issue, and we are responsible for ensuring that we find all cases and individuals that may have been exposed so that we can ensure that they're not sick, that we can follow them if there was a true exposure, and we can work with them directly with our public health nurses and public health investigators to make sure that they have what they need, as well as they are not showing signs that they may be converting to a case. That is very helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Jan. Uh, on Quest Diagnostics, I, I believe they released information that they're going to be able to provide testing kits between 100,000 and 500,000 test kits in the next 30 days. Do we know where those are going to be distributed? Is it based upon needs from communities or counties, or are they just going to allocate where they've seen the past history of high need areas? Yeah, so you'll need to speak directly with Quest. 
but it will depend on actually how many tests they have available and their network of providers. So they're not going to go through the Department of Public Health. The Department of Public Health, we have a lab and we will continue to perform some of those testing, the test on individuals who have um, the criteria that we think is um, consistent with NCOVI-19. Um, but Quest has a huge field of um, private providers that they work with. Do you, does the Department of Public and Health, uh, DPH, keep track of the community areas where the doctor's offices may be requesting the tests so that you can keep numbers on your own rather than depending on private parties? And you see exactly. With that. So things are getting um, very complicated and things are changing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. But we have stated that any diagnosis of NCOVI-19, of the disease COVID-19, needs to be reported to the Department of Public Health. So we um, hopefully will be receiving those abnormal results. So for instance, the same thing exists for certain diseases, have to be, deported, have to be reported to the Department of Public Health. That doesn't violate a HIPAA rule because you're just keeping numbers, you're just keeping track. So well, that's different because the Department of Public Health um, is allowed to get certain information from private providers depending on the disease. So for instance, STDs, uh, we are supposed to have information on gonorrhea, chlamydia, measles, so that we can do something about it. We can track down the individuals who may be transmitting disease in the community. So not everything but some diseases we need to know who's testing positive and you know who they are and where they live because we have public health nurses and public health investigators who either need to call or we need to go out and find individuals to ensure that they, for instance, are not working in a place where they can transmit diseases. So for instance, um, salmonella or shigella, if there's an individual who's preparing food, we need to know who that individual is if they're coming down with a particular disease so that we can take them out of their work and protect the, the um, community. Well, thank you for that clarification, Doctor. Uh, that's it for me, thanks. I don't know how the other council members may have more. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. King. And I just want to point out all the information that you just gave us will be available on the city website for anybody who's watching. And you can pick up a flyer here at the city uh, and also find this on the city website with CDC, I mean, um, LA County Department of Public Health information. Thank so you thank very you. much. You're welcome. Okay, we will now have staff updates on disaster response and recovery. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Waiting for the slide to come up. All right. <clears throat> All right. So recently we've been very busy um, preparing for co coronavirus in case. Um, it does enter our area. We've been participating in regular conference calls with the Department of Public Health. We've drafted a pandemic response plan. We have participated in conference calls with local doctors and clinics. And tomorrow, <clears throat> excuse me, the leaders of our emergency operations and our team will be getting together to go through the pandemic response plan. And to give you an idea of what's in that is um, it includes infection control strategies, which are similar to what Dr. King explained, social distancing, things like that. It also goes into um, how we will coordinate with outside agencies, continuity of city services, how we will support the community, and how we will manage sick employees. In other areas, we've continued our preparedness, our general preparedness. 40 people recently participated in our preparedness for seniors and received their emergency backpacks. Our Spring Cert class began on March 5th and we have 18 participants. 
Uh, the Malibu CERT team will be meeting this Saturday, March 14th, 9 a.m. at City Hall. So if there's any uh, CERT graduates out there who are interested in getting involved with the team, they are welcome to attend. And again, a reminder that the Community Wildfire Protection Plan is um, moving along very well. And right now we have a community survey that we encourage people to go onto the city's website and take that survey so that we can get your input. And that's it. Uh, if you go to the wildfire uh, safety, city Malibu city.org wildfires plan survey. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm afraid to cough. I'm like, everyone's gonna stare at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as always, sign up for disaster notifications and alerts at malibucity.org slash news uh, or malibucity.org disaster notifications and our city hotline 310-456-9982. And don't forget one call to City Hall, 310-456-CITY extension, which is extension 311. All right, that's it. Thank you, Susan. Richard Mollica and Yolanda Bundy. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. To give you a quick update as to where we are with the fire rebuild, we've approved a little over 200 homes, uh, and this is a breakdown of those 200 homes. There's also been additional applications that have been approved for second units and accessory structures and also for landscaping. But once again, this is specific to single family homes. And as you can see, the majority of these are like for like or no more than 10%. <clears throat> we are starting to also bring forward uh, coastal development permit applications to the Planning Commission. Uh, we will have one that was an ACDP but um, was requested to be brought back. So uh, we're doing that as fast as we can. We have to meet a 21 day notice. And so to do that, we had to skip one uh, commission meeting but move it to the next one. And that will be uh, the second of the coastal development permits to go before the planning commission. One has been approved and this will be number two. The purpose of this chart here is just to show how we had a large volume of applications come through in the summer months. And however, we've saw a drastic drop in those applications for January and February. And you can see March there at the very end, we've only had so far one planning verification uh, submitted to the planning department and a couple of administrative plan reviews where someone wanted to perhaps add height over uh, the existing height of the home or do something a little bit more than 10 percent but our planning verifications the like for like aspect has slowed down a bit we have been implementing the fee waiver program as approved by the council and to date we've waived a total of 2.3 million dollars worth of fees Good evening, City Council. As far as building and safety, we have 75 permits still on plan check. Uh, today, we have issued 81 permits and we have completed two. This week, we have uh, another four families are going to be getting their uh, rebuild permit. So we're, the numbers are increasing. I also have 10 other uh, plans that are approved, partially approved pending uh, fire and so we're just waiting for that. I'm hoping within the next two weeks we'll be close to the 100 number. Um, in regards of those 200 families that we haven't heard, um, we have the, the data collected of uh, emails and we're calling them. Uh, we are also sending emails constantly. Um, keep on meeting with the families and we're sending them, them all the information that, uh, that we have provided on our website. We're also very close to approving the first multifamily project that we lost in the city of Malibu, Malibu Gardens. I'm hoping within the next two weeks, uh, we will give them uh, their permits to uh, continue their construction and thus 12 uh, single family uh, permits. That's all I have for you guys tonight. Okay, thank you very much. One more slide, sorry. Sure. Um, we understand that uh, because folks being displaced may have a hard time receiving the mailings uh, for the addresses that we have on file because in addition to emails and phone calls, we've been sending out uh, postcards with deadlines of when things are coming up. Uh, for anyone who wishes to receive that information via email, they can contact Kathleen Stecco in the planning department. Uh, we have Kathleen's email on this slide for everyone. 
but if they send us an email, we can make it a point that instead of a, a notice that's in a mailing, we can send it via email if that's easier for folks. Okay, thank you both very much. Okay, moving on. We have public comments on items not on the agenda. I've got three speaker slips, Susan Hahn, Paul Grisanti, and John Mazza. Evening. And first of all, thanks for all that you do. Um, my name is Susan. I worked at the election at Bluffs Park last week as a poll worker. And I've worked five elections in Malibu. And I wanted to offer some insight on some of the issues we had with the long lines that were there. First and foremost, I think, was the reduction of the polling locations down to two. Previously had, I believe, nine locations in Malibu. Um, second was a lack of staffing at each location. Um, I'm not sure if we have anything to do about the fact that we reduced them to two location, polling locations, um, probably because of the cost of the equipment of the new, but I guarantee you that if we had additional staffing, like in the form of volunteering, the first time I worked on election was 40 years ago when I was in college. I volunteered for course credit. Maybe we could do that with Pepperdine students because I guarantee you that if I, if there were volunteers that came in for, like I said, class credit, they could be trained to go through the lines. We could speed it up incredibly. We could train them while they're waiting in line to select the poll pass and do that because I could get people who were checked in and had the poll pass in and out in under 10 minutes. We could do that again. I'd be more than happy to offer any suggestions as far as training them to help, because I plan to work the election in November again, so. And we certainly want to avoid that. I know that even with the two locations, if we had staffing to train people, encourage them first to take advantage of the early voting, which a lot of people did not. The first date at Bluffs Park, we had less than 30 people showed up. So, and it obviously was the fact that you could, anyone in LA County could vote. Now, we had additional people coming from out of the city coming to our location, and that backed it up. And then we had a lot of people that showed up at five to eight that wanted to rest, register for the first time. Since that was the first thing we could do, I mean, all these things combined contributed to the fact that we had those long lines. But I know there's ways around this and things that I can we can do. And if you wanted to meet or if I could meet with someone, I would be more than happy to offer my suggestions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Paul Grisanti, followed by John Mazza. Good evening, Mayor and Council people. I just want to start out by I like the presentation by Dr. King. I followed her out to the hallway out there because I had heard that there was limited testing being done in China and in the facilities where people are quarantined with antivirals that are used, previously were used in Ebola and other things. And she has heard of it too, but she had no, no input on what kind of feedback they're getting. The other thing, and the reason I actually put in my speaker slip, was to take a moment to remind people that on Thursday and Friday of this week, there's going to be a meeting about the bi-district elections. So we'll see you here at 6 o'clock on Thursday, and at 6 o'clock on Friday at the uh, Malibu High School. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. The next speaker is John Mazza. Uh, greetings. Uh, the Planning Commission and the staff have been working for really five or six or seven years on trying to straighten out the problems with sort of defective CUPs at uh, Nobu and Soho. And We've made some progress. 
the Planning Commission. We had a, a good meeting last week about trying to make coming north on Coast Highway safer. And that will come out probably at another two meetings. But in the meantime, I've been working with Steve Yearing and, and talking to the management at Nobu and the management at Soho and the Chamber of Commerce about a solution because the, there is no solution, in my opinion, uh, to the actual parking in that area. It just does not exist. And it's mainly because the, the businesses are so successful. And it, it's, but it does affect the neighborhood and it does affect traffic and it does affect safety. So uh, in working with Nobu and Soho, uh, they proposed and we proposed that some kind of shuttle service be set up uh, like they have in most coastal city, well, in a lot of coastal city towns, especially like Laguna and Dana Point work together so they cover 11 miles of coastline. Um, and we realized that there's going to be an extra two and a half acres of parking in the Civic Center. So uh, the Chamber of Commerce has reviewed this and uh, are very enthusiastic about it. We have not gone to other business leaders because it's not our job really. Uh, but <clears throat> what is sort of proposed is to have a shuttle service like uh, Mr. Koss set up about five years ago that worked, that would go between the Civic Center area, mainly Cross Creek Road uh, and Webway, down to uh, Nobu and back around and, and service the whole shopping centers. And what I'm asking you to do is uh, take the ball and uh, ask staff to study an assessment district. Uh, I, the Chamber of Commerce believes that, that there would be, get, be enthusiastic response in getting tourists and locals around their shopping areas. Their businesses are in serious trouble right now, especially the restaurants. And so uh, this is about as far as I feel Steve and I should take it as planning commissioners. And uh, I hope you can uh, direct staff to study the issue and talk to the parties involved trying to set up an assessment district. It would be very little cost to each individual business if all the businesses on that route contributed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we will have a update from the city manager. Good evening, thank you all for being here. Uh, quite a few announcements that I have tonight. Um, thank you, Mr. Grisanti, for mentioning the upcoming meetings. We have two uh, special city council meetings th uh, this week, one on Thursday here at City Hall at 6 o'clock and one at Friday on Friday at 6 o'clock at Malibu High School to talk about the district elections. Um, and if you'd like to get more information on that, you can go on the city's website at malibucity.org slash district elections, and you can look at the draft maps. There's four different versions, and the boundaries change on each map. Um, so I uh, hope everybody will take time to look at that. A um, couple things coming up um, for the Planning Commission. On March 16th, uh, they'll discuss accessory dwelling units. And on March 30th, we'll have a special Planning Commission meeting where the Planning Commission will discuss short-term rentals. And we have a Zeracis meeting coming up on March 17th uh, where they will discuss parking as a standalone use and that agenda packet will be coming out this week, which feeds directly into what Mr. Mazza was just talking about. Um, we are aware um, that uh, there's a, a, a lot of desire to find some off-site parking. The first step to finding parking is to get an ordinance that allows parking as a standalone use on um, either the city, one of the city's vacant land properties or another property. Um, but in the meantime, what I have been working on uh, for the summer is a, a pilot program uh, for parking for some of the businesses uh, whereby we'll uh, look at getting a shuttle for employees for the Memorial Day weekend and the 4th of July weekend. And we've been coordinating with uh, Nobu and Soho and quite a few of the businesses and restaurants in that area near the pier um, to get their employees to park off-site uh, for those weekends on a city property. We're going to issue a temporary use permit for those weekends um, and see uh, how that helps and how that works and how uh, if it really does help get us uh, some additional parking for the public. So we are working on that and can certainly uh, talk about some of the other things as part of the budget. 
Um, the Civic Center Way project with uh, the City Council approved a few meetings ago was appealed to the Coastal Commission, so that is now on hold, even though uh, we did open bids for that last week, and that will be heard by the Coastal Commission uh, hopefully in April. Uh, the temporary skate park, the bids for the asphalt will open this week, so that is moving along pursuant to direction. And we'll be holding our first public meeting for the permanent skate park for the design of that on Tuesday, March 31st at 6 o'clock here at City Hall. And you can go on the city's website at malibucity.org slash skatepark for more information on that. Um, I'm sure you've all seen we're expecting rain tomorrow, so we will have city crews monitoring streets to make sure that there uh, isn't any substantial mud and debris coming down. Um, I also wanted to give a law enforcement update. Uh, two weekends ago, we had uh, five units from the California Highway Patrol here in Malibu uh, providing some additional enforcement. And as part of that, they were here for one day. They issued um, 86 enforcement stops, which resulted in 69 citations. So shout out to the CHP for being here and keeping our city safe. Um, I also have been working with the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. We have a special suppression team um, available to us for a 30-day period um, that will be read, running dedicated cars um, to assess, assist us with the additional homeless and transient problems that have been occurring, particularly in the evening hours. Um, so they have been uh, working over the last uh, two weeks, and they've made 53 different contacts and arrested four separate people uh, this past week. So um, definitely seeing results uh, from that. And if you're having issues with that and you're a business owner, particularly at night, please contact me. Um, I wanted to give a little further update. Um, thank you, Susan, for your update on what the city and city hall has been doing in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Here at City Hall, um, we are uh, having staff go around and clean all of the public surfaces um, every couple of hours. Uh, we also have staff who serve our public counters, wiping down and cleaning all surfaces between each visitor. Um, and so we're making sure that the public and our employees are safe. Um, we do have a robust plan in place if uh, in the event that we do have to close City Hall and we've looked at what employees can work from home and what that would look like um, and also what city activities or uh, facilities or events would need to close in the event of that. Um, we are reviewing right now all of our senior center programs and activities, as well as our um, parks and recs programs and classes, and try to determine uh, if we need to cancel any of those um, out of the abundance of caution for our community. Um, so we'll certainly be providing that information out. Um, obviously, we don't want to close anything or um, halt any programs, but we do want to make sure that people are safe and healthy. Um, and so we are uh, also, as uh, um, Susan mentioned, have coordinated with local doctors. So I participated on a call today with um, our local Malibu Urgent Care and several of the doctors here in town and the pharmacies. Um, the point of that was just to start a conversation to make sure that um, if there is an issue where we need to start testing a lot of people, we are doing it as a coordinated community. Um, and the city you know, wants to be able to help with that in, a, in any way we can. Um, so just trying to stay ahead of uh, what hopefully will not become a problem, but our, obviously our first concern is keeping the community safe um, and working through the county on any official message um, and any official information. The city, um, just like in any other disaster, falls under the auspices of the county. So we will be pushing our official information out based on information that we are getting from the county. Um, but certainly, if you have concerns or questions, don't hesitate to call my office. Um, and that's all I have, unless you have any questions for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Reva. All right. Council members, uh, reports. Who would like to go first? Rick? I'll go first. Thank you very much for coming down here and giving us your report on where the rubber meets the road. And thank you for your civic duty, not only in this election, but in previous ones for being willing to do that. I think your idea of uh, students getting course credit is an excellent one. And I think uh, we should figure out how to bring that up with Pepperdine. Um, yeah. I think that's a, a great idea. And it, it also educates them on you know, democracy in America and all that stuff. Um, I think you're right. A lot of people, you know, the, the, the polls were open, was it like 11 days or something? Yeah, Whatever. 
So we went there, my wife and I went there probably three days before the actual, uh, you know, we drug our feet like most people, but we didn't go on election day. And uh, our, we went in the afternoon and, our, and there was nobody there and it was great. And they, we were, had a captive audience. We had all the, uh, you know, volunteers uh, pointing everything out to us. And so it was good. So that's, I think, the key for everybody is if they're going to do this, reduce the amount of, of um, places but extend the window, then people need to not wait a last second. And that's probably the key to going forward. But I appreciate you coming down and giving us some feedback. And maybe what I would recommend is um, put all your thoughts into an email and send it to Heather since she's sort of... Uh, you know, the duty expert on elections and as per the city and maybe uh, she could forward that feedback up to um, the county so that they can uh, get the benefit of your after action report, so to speak, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. No, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Also, Jenny Nelson. Right, right. With the new touch screens and everything. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So, yeah. so it would help if we had volunteers so they could Okay, but yeah, thanks, th thanks for coming and giving us your after action. That's really wonderful. Uh, John Mazza, it sounds like you've gotten some response already from the city manager on the parking issue. I would like to chat with you and Steve sometime about it and get your full um, data dump before we take the ball and run with it because um, that's very interesting and a, a big problem in town that we need to solve and yeah. there's probably a time to do it. So thanks for coming and giving your um, taking to the podium and addressing that issue and being willing to work with the, the um, businesses in town for a solution. I know they're looking for a solution also. My, I went to a, along with the mayor, as a part of our uh, school separation ad hoc committee, met with the, our negotiating team for Malibu with the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District negotiating team last Tuesday to discuss the, uh, legislation to deal with the parcel tax issue as, a, as one of the components that we have to deal with in the separation of the two schools. It was on short notice and it was a good meeting. And then on Thursday I went to their actual board meeting and I got there at six o'clock and finally got to speak at 11.30. So now I know what you all have to go through. Because I mean the place was packed and there was a lot of uh, items on the agenda that everybody wanted to talk about. By the time they got to me, I was the last guy in the room and it was late at night. But it was addressing the same thing, essentially encouraging them to support the legislation that we're trying to put through that will deal with the property tax issue. And we're working toward having a meeting with our state representatives, Henry Stern, Butcher Bloom, and maybe Ben Allen with the two negotiating teams, again, to discuss how important it is to get ahead of the game and get the ball rolling on that one potential impediment to um, solving the challenging problem of separating the two schools. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Bedler? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I'd kind of second what Rick said to, to every all of our speakers that we had here this evening. I don't need to go over that. Uh, thank you to Dr. King from LA County Department of Health. Last week I attended a Clean Power Alliance uh, meeting in downtown Los Angeles. And one thing that came up um, was some of the concern that our residents, or that I brought forward uh, when it was discussed among some other cities about uh, Edison's uh, power shutoffs, the PSPS shutoffs that um, our residents experience. And I think that CPA is gonna try to take a little bit of a stance and just try to get some more information out uh, to, from Edison. Um, so that those notifications are very clear to everybody and hopefully um, they're looking at some different microgrid stuff for critical infrastructure to eliminate the challenges that are associated with that. So, thank you. Thank you, Skyler. Jefferson? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, John Mazza, thank you for that extra effort on behalf of the city by you and Steve. I had a conversation with Reva this week about uh, a jitney or a bus that we used to have here and we went into some details. She's researching that uh, probably as we speak, but I think it's a great idea. It was successful a couple of years ago. Uh, this one will be easy. Let's just pull it off and I hope the council will follow through and, and help everybody get this, uh, the answers to this Soho Nobu issue. Um, appreciate the extra effort and thank you Riva for the extra effort as well. 
Uh, today we had our library meeting. I don't want to cut into Karen's moment, but uh, it was a successful meeting. It took uh, one hour. We covered a lot of topics, uh, including uh, what we want to do in the future with the library set-aside funds, and uh, I think it was pretty well organized, and we'll be coming forward to the council with our decisions and our hopes sometime in the next uh, week or two, maybe three weeks. And then I'll let you do the details because you're, you're running that show. Um, briefly, I just want to reach out. I'll put something on the uh, next agenda to see if we can get council support to a letter for, uh, to Henry Stern about a property acquisition in Agora Hills uh, called the Gateway Properties. And I'll put that on the agenda and then I'll explain it in detail next meeting if it makes it on that agenda. Uh, and I believe that the council would probably support that letter to the to Henry Stern, and I'll get that on next agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jefferson. Mikey. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, thank you to the speakers. I had a couple observations on the voting. On I went on election day to Juan Cabrillo, and actually I was lucky I got right in. I am very pretty much electronically savvy. Someone had to show me how to use it still. There were some things that were not intuitive, especially when I saw people backing up behind me. The more button and stuff like that, it was, and the way it came out and went back in. Uh, and so that was noticeable to me that I thought it would just be completely intuitive. I didn't think it was entirely. And the other thing that was noticeable is that if you'd come early and you happen to be a Democrat, a lot of the candidates you might have voted for had already bailed out of the race at a late date. That was an interesting observation. I hadn't expected that one. So anyhow, I like the electronic idea of electronic polling, but I agree with you. I was in Santa Monica that night, and there was a line where I was for hours. And at 8 o'clock when I left the meeting, that line was huge. And those people must have been pissed. <laughs> so, um, but thanks, thanks on that. And John, I think a lot of us have felt that that's the only answer for a long time. I've been discussing it for a long time. Um, so, yes, there's just too many cars and too few places to put them in that part of Malibu. So I uh, understand that one 100%. Absolutely. So really glad we're getting the parking standalone back in front of us. I think that's excellent. I think we need to look at that. Um, update on my activities. I have, I have a concern I want to share. And I've noticed talking to residents that are trying to rebuild, there's just, I, I don't know the answer, and I've discussed it with Reva, and I don't, I don't know if there is a great answer, but there's a couple of longtime Malibu residents that really do want to rebuild, but for a variety of reasons are really going to be pressed to make the deadline. And there's two main reasons. One is they have insurance issues they haven't been able to solve, so they're totally stuck. And the other one is they've had, just because your house burns down doesn't mean something else horrible in your life, like your wife having a stroke as one example, doesn't also happen. And it's just going to be really, really hard to get going. So I, I just want to express, mostly the city council, I am concerned with a few really good, long-term, excellent Malibu residents that are struggling to make the deadline. Um, and I just want to point that out. Um, my activities... Recently, worth talking about, um, I attended uh, Senator Stern's scoping meeting on legislative priorities. Um, it was a room filled with a lot of people from a lot of places, from cities, county, even Ventura County, fire, sheriff. I mean, there's people all over the place. Um, that was interesting. I thought it was great that Henry sort of wanted to sit down and go through a massive list of, of what his legislative priorities might be, and that was worthy. Um, after that, on March 4th, the mayor and I met with Acting Captain Chuck Becerra and had a talk um, for a good hour. It was a really excellent talk just about, there's been a lot of changes, as we all know, and we just really wanted to make sure that we are forming a solid bridge of really good communication with the acting captain or the permanent captain, whatever it is. So... I thought it was time very well spent. On March 5th, um, several of us, uh, Karen, 
uh, Susan, uh, Alex from the People's Concern, we, we attended the Homeless Initiative Conference in downtown LA. Basically, we were downtown with about a thousand other people concerned with homelessness and trying to all be together and talk about strategies and um, legislation and what's coming down the pike on how to deal with this overwhelming and growing issue. Um, all the supervisors were either there or, or spoke. And uh, I will say that Sheila Kuehl was excellent. Um, she's a very good public speaker. So, and on the heels of that, I want to read a letter that we got at the city the other day. And I know that city councilors have, have seen it, but I think it speaks to the homeless issue and it's very rare to get a letter like this. I'm going to share it quickly. Hello, my name is Daniel. I have been an active part of Malibu for many years. I'm a recipient of the funds that are being contracted through the people concerned. I wanted to write to you regarding the housing and answer any questions you might have considering the help I am receiving. I know many have questions if the funds are being are making it through to us in the streets and what kind of help we're receiving and to what extent. I would be glad to help answer that in any way I can. I want at the same time to thank you for putting the effort out to make changes in Malibu's homeless situation. As you know, there are some that just cannot be helped or don't want to for whatever reason. I am one that has been fighting so hard to get off the streets for a while now. My story is long and interesting. I am not a drug user. I fell under a very hard situation that led me to a place where I only had the clothes on my back. I want to thank you for stepping forward and giving me that helping hand I needed. My first night off the streets in the temporary housing, I cried and thanked God for saving me. You have no idea how grateful I am that the funds came available and Malibu stepped up. Bless you all. Please know you have changed my life and you all deserve huge praise. I don't feel the email covers how seriously grateful I am. I would like to meet you all uh, that are responsible, and thank you. I, I did actually give Daniel a call, and he's uh, in a temporary shelter in Long Beach, and he has a Section 8 voucher and is waiting for permanent housing, and uh, he's actually was Calabasas High School graduate, came out to Malibu working, and things went wrong, and that's how I ended up. So I just wanted to share that because I think sometimes it's hard to connect what we're trying to do with, with someone's story. And as an update, right now, where are we on dealing with homelessness? It's, it's, a, it's a big, difficult job. You know the council's looking at options for what we're calling alternative sleeping location, basically a shelter and, and safe parking program. It's, that process is not quick. So basically we're looking at any and all properties that are a maybe right now and trying to find out what might work. There's so many factors involved that I really can't give anything more than that because there is nothing more than that. We're just trying to figure out what locations make sense, what locations will work, what locations will satisfy the law so we regain some of our rights under under Martin versus the city of Boise, trying to find that that location that makes sense. So, of course, there'll be way more community outreach on this as we go forward, but I just want to update. We're just basically in the trying to figure it out and looking around phase and talking with our partners at the county and talking with partners anywhere we can. Um, two last things quickly. I don't have kids at the Sky School anymore, but if I know when it is, I always try to go to their mask talent event. It's called Mask. They've done it for years. I just, I just, a shout out to our amazing high school. The talent is always so amazing. It, it, it honestly fries my brain. There's, they have the most talented kids. And this year, what was noticeable was how many bands there were. I mean, there's always incredible talent, but there was, there had to have been like six different bands, and they were, all of them, excellent. And and some solo acts, too, that would just, I mean, you just know some of these people are going to be household names at some point. And that's typically how it is going to mask. So just a shout out to those kids and that program and their their teachers is, is great. 
And the last thing is, I just want to let people know, on Thursday, March 12th at 10 a.m. is the next City Manager Roundtable here at City Hall, and I will be joining our City Manager to discuss all things Malibu. So love it if you want to come down and talk about what's on your mind and our minds, and uh, that's this Thursday at 10 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, without going over everything that's been said, um, I wanted to thank Dr. King for coming here um, and giving us uh, just factual update. Uh, and it seems like this coronavirus, the news is changing every hour, so I'm glad to have this hour's update. Um, Susan, thank you, A, for all your years volunteering as a poll worker, but B, for coming to give us this report. Um, I did wait till the last day to go vote, um, but I got in on time, and uh, yeah, uh, the volunteer idea is great. Um, I'm happy to bring that up with Pepperdine and see if it gets any traction. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for, for giving us your observations and offering your help. Um, I want to repeat everything. Um, okay, my report. Uh, we had a special COG meeting. That's our Council of Government, Las Virginis Malibu COG, uh, regarding the uh, meeting we had had the day before uh, downtown with the sheriff. And the voting body uh, passed a motion to memorialize what had transpired the day before in that same group's meeting with this sheriff and his staff. Uh, and that letter did go out. Um, I had a meeting here at the city with superintendent of our school district, uh, Dr. Drotti. He gave a presentation to Riva and uh, Lisa Soger and myself about the current state of uh, the district financial picture and what it means for the future. So um, if you are interested in that, you I would suggest you look on the school district website. Um, I was asked to uh, address the Pepperdine student ambassadors, which I very much appreciated, and I gave them a glimpse uh, of things that the city is working on now and our future plans. Um, I had my monthly League of Cities, uh, County Division, Board of Directors, Legislative Conference call. Um, I introduced, I'm sorry to all other library speaker series, uh, featured speakers that I've introduced, but this last one was really my favorite and I encourage everybody, please, look for those dates and come to them. Uh, I had the privilege of introducing someone named Mohammed Al-Samawi. He's an interfaith activist and a refugee from Yemen, and his story is mind-blowing. Uh, and it's actually being made into a movie, so I'm not giving a plug for anything in particular, but his work and his story are just remarkable. Um, I attended the latest PTSA meeting at Malibu Middle and High School last week, and the very big concern at the moment is about uh, any possible changes in the permitting, uh, in inter-district permitting for students, and of course the district budget. So uh, those issues do affect us all as a community, not just uh, whether or not you have kids in school at the moment. Um, yes, Rick and I and uh, our whole negotiating team went to Santa Monica and had a meeting with the Santa Monica side on the continuing uh, reorganization effort. And it, it's been a long haul. Anybody who's been following this, uh, we are going back and forth and uh, there is something, uh, our final agenda item tonight is about that. And yes, Mikey and I met with Lieutenant Chuck Becerra and another lieutenant from Lost Hills uh, here at the city. And um, I, I will just say for the record, anything we can do to increase communication and cooperation between the city and the sheriffs 
department is something I'm interested in. Um, Mikey and I and Susan and I forget who else, Alex Gittinger, uh, all went to the fourth annual uh, homeless initiative conference in downtown LA. There were a lot of people there, coronavirus or not. Um, there's a huge amount of work going on in the city of LA and the county. As much as it seems like, maybe it seems like there's not, uh, one of the slides that stuck in my mind was that, I don't know if you remember the number, X amount of people got off the streets, but more than that um, became homeless this past year. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I went to two amazing community events this past week, and one was Mask. I went a different night from Mikey, and um, he humbly did not mention that one of the best acts uh, was one that his niece was in. They won. Oh, they won. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was not a judge. He was not a judge. Um, and then I attended the memorial service for Phil Cott, the principal at Webster Elementary School for 23 years from 1990 to 2013. And if that didn't say a lot about the Malibu community, then nothing does. There must have been 500 people there. It went on over three hours. Nobody was bored. Nobody looked like how much longer. It, it was a gigantic reunion for one thing and a tribute to somebody who I think for decades will have a ripple effect on this community. Somebody who embodies the best in a person and in a leader. And he really gave a gift to all of us. Again, whether you had kids at Webster School or not, he affected this community for the better. So I just wanted to say that and thank all the people who planned that. Um, there's been some discussion uh, that I've had with some various people about the possibility of a school resource officer. Um, I've been approached about um, the possibility of the city um, participating in some funding for that. And I would just like to say, since we're getting close to entering the annual budget process, I would like to request that we look at this as an item, um, whether or not it's feasible and uh, and if so, um, how much we would participate in that funding. Um, as Jefferson said, we had a library subcommittee meeting today. Uh, we discussed uh, the set-aside funds and uh, future plans. And I think um, library programs need to be considered along with all of the uh, potential uh, what I will call wish list items for us as a city, um, especially as it uh, pertains to the three properties that the city closed escrow on in September of 2018. Uh, obviously, we had the fire two months later, and that kind of put that whole process on hold. And I'm hoping sometime soon we can re-examine that process and, and go into uh, the community uh, participation that we've talked about with uh, regard to a survey and town hall meetings about how we all as a community would like to see those, um, those properties utilized. Um, I do have to say, I don't know if we've announced this. Um, disappointingly, we received notification that we were not selected in this round of the 100-day challenge, which we applied for, uh, particularly uh, looking at a safe parking program. So that doesn't mean we, we can't apply in another um, funding cycle with the 100-day challenge, uh, or that we cannot continue with the other uh, things that we've been looking at for our homeless and uh, RV and, uh, vehicle living population. I, sorry, that was so long. That's it for me. Okay, we will be moving on to consent calendar.
We have one item pulled, 3B4. Can I make a motion to approve the consent calendar pullings, item 3B4? Oh, I guess, and 3B5? And 3B5. I, second. I guess it's two items. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mayor, um, the city attorney is going to uh, correct 3B4. So on 3B4, the only uh, change is, is uh, we're suggesting a, a correction to Section 2 of the resolution, and um, it would, our suggestion is to replace the current Section 2 with the following, which would be the city council hereby approves and authorizes the acceptance of the dedication of roadway easement for a Malibu Development Company LLC to the city dedicating the property as described and depicted in Attachment 1, Dedication of Roadway Easement. As found in the adoption of the development agreement, the roadway easement dedication is consistent with the objectives, policies, general land uses, and programs specified in the general plan. The proposed roadway easement dedication will serve to enhance the Malibu general plan mission statement and further the city's goal of a safe, environmentally sensitive, and efficient transportation system. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Need to move to prove that correction? Yeah. So yes. We, we just need a motion to uh, adopt the resolution with that change. I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, item 3B5. Okay. We have a. I, I, I can answer questions after um, public comment. Okay, so we have one public comment from Ryan Embry. Uh, Mention to this item because it, it has to do with ensuring um, the city's vehicle and there's been other casualty losses for city uh, equipment and vehicles that were Apparently not replaced or restored and so this is a new agreement uh, apparently a template that the county wants to use but it omits a lot of specificity that is really basic insurance information and I sent you an email about this today I'm not so sure which council members have read it you did okay so I also sent you a picture of the radar trailer which is this which we don't have anymore. And that, um, I was told, was totaled, damaged, and never got replaced. And so that, including the instance where one of the, the LPR vehicles flipped over and got damaged, and then another um, sheriff vehicle was also totaled, um, I think it was a VOP vehicle, who pays the deductible in the instance of this was one of my very basic questions, which is not included in the uh, either the staff report or the insurance information provided by the county and the other things that I, I wrote in the email. So if, if you can have those answered or actually I'd suggest that you continue this item until you get it in writing what it is, because having a staff try and speak for the county at tonight's meeting as to why something is not in the agreement is really non-binding. Mayor, if I could just briefly answer that, um, I, I don't. I wouldn't recommend continuing this item. And what I would say is, in regard to the volunteers on patrol, um, the amount of um, help that that organization provides to the city um, is invaluable. Um, they write uh, tens of thousands of parking tickets each year. Um, this uh, past weekend, one of our volunteers on patrol was first on site to put out that small fire on Bluffs Park. I have photos of him with the fire extinguisher putting it out. Um, so the services that they provide to the city, uh, I can't, or they're, they're priceless. So I think if we had to pay a deductible, um, I'd see the city attorney not shaking his head at me, but um, that was my personal opinion. Sure. I, I can address a little bit in this. Um, the insurance provision was, was uh, negotiated with the county. They have different provisions because they're self-insured, so it looks a little different from our normal 
insurance provision, but you should look at the risk of loss section of this, which basically puts any damage that occurs to the vehicle after it's been accepted by the county is their responsibility for taking care of. So if we have concerns about them not being solvent, there would be more of an issue, but I don't think we're gonna have an issue dealing with um, going after them if there's ever a problem to any damage to the vehicles based on the provisions in this agreement, especially, especially um, section nine. And if we had to pay the deductible, I don't think that's an issue. I don't think we Thank you. be responsible for that anyway. Can I make a motion to approve item 3B5? I was just going to add something. I did read it in detail. <clears throat> it was above my head, uh, legal legalese, and I'm glad you took a look at it, Trevor, because I read through it, and it appeared that Ryan had some concerns. I didn't know how to address them, but now that you have, I feel more confident. Thank you for reviewing it. I will second it then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to item 4A. May we have a staff report, please? Good evening, council members. This evening, um, I'm introducing the developer feed program and fire station plan for fire protection district of Los Angeles County. On March 11 of 2019, the city council adopted resolution 1911, developer fee and fire station plan for the consolidated fire protection uh, district of Los Angeles County. City Council also directed staff to bring back an item to consider future participation in the Fire Protection District. The goal of this program is to generate funds for capital projects necessary to maintain the fire protection services within the existing serving areas of the Fire District. This program funds the acquisition, construction, improvement, and the equipment of the fire station facilities. Without the fee, the fire station construction and equipment will be outpaced by development. Just to give you a brief history uh, on this uh, developer fee, on July 12, of nine, uh, 1990, the County of Los Angeles Board of Supervisors adopted a resolution establishing this developer fee. In August 1st of 1990, the county implemented the developer fee program for, for Malibu, Santa Monica, Santa Clarita Valley, and Antilope Valley. In February 12, 1991, during the incorporation, the city of Malibu entered into an agreement with the Board of Supervisors, establishing the Consolidated Fire Protection District. On January 28, 2020, the, board, uh, the County Board of Supervisors conducted a public hearing to update these developer fee program, including a revised fire station plan and developer fee summary. The current Malibu, Santa Monica Mountain area rate is 97 cents per square foot of new development. No charge is being proposed at this year. It's important to mention that out of all the fire rebuilds, this fee is not being added to the rebuilds. The county administ administrators administers and collect this fee. Under this agreement, resolution 2011, the city and the fire district protection, the city must adopt by resolution the updated developer fee and fire station plan within 60 days of the board adoption. Since 1991, the city has adopted to remain in the fire district for fire and emergency and medical services. If the county votes to opt, if the council, I apologize, if the council votes to opt out of the fire district, the city must evaluate how to fund and provide the immediate and future services. Staff is seeking council direction to remain in the fire district, including the adoption of this annual resolution. 
Thank you, Yolanda. Okay, we have one public speaker card from Ryan Embry. Uh, I spoke, I think it was last year on this item. Um, again, I'm not against the fire department in any way, and I'm certainly I'm totally in favor of the volunteers on patrol, and that wasn't my issue on the last slide. It had to do with the insurance provision uh, contract. But in this case, the fire developer fee essentially leaves the city of Malibu. It is never spent here on anything that would directly benefit us. Um, it was said years ago that, yeah, if they build more fire stations far away, like in Santa Clarita, that eventually maybe some of those fire trucks might come help us if we had a big fire here. Well, history has shown that that actually wasn't the case. And it's time the city of Malibu established its own fire developer fee so that the dollars collected on new development stays in the city and somehow benefits the area here where we bear the brunt of the fires that start elsewhere. The developer fee for new construction in new areas should cover the construction costs of new fire stations in those areas. And how we're in this larger um, funding program is kind of reminds me of what's going on with the school district at the moment. Um, when I called years ago, I was told that a teardown in Malibu Colony and a replacement home would initiate the whole fee being collected again. There would be no credit for the size or square footage of the home uh, torn down for the new replacement home, that they just keep re recollecting the same fee over and over. I am in favor completely of a waiver of collecting this fee for a fire rebuild, and that's not an issue. But the amount of development that it's occurring in Malibu is very low, and yet we still burden the new construction with this fee, and that's not my point. It's that the fee leaves Malibu. We don't see the construction of the improvements here, and we need them. So it's really time that the city establish its own program, which keeps the money here as some sort of mitigation or help for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Council discussion? Um, maybe I could... Uh, ask Rick because he, he's kind of the specialist on this Rick would this have any effect do you think uh, in mutual aid if something like this was affected I'm, I'm just looking out for some kind of resource knowledge that I don't have maybe you could address that quickly I don't I didn't see the resource issue in in this uh, item but can you comment on it can it help us out Again, I'm not a financial expert, and I'm certainly not here to speak for the fire department. However, I have worked for the fire department. And I think what this is, this is big arrow stuff. Uh, I used to be stationed in Santa Clarita where they have massive developments going in. And when you have a giant new tracks of homes with hundreds of homes going in, these fees are put up by the developers to ensure that there's new fire stations being built. And back when I was out there, it was after the financial crisis, and I used to joke that, you know, they were keeping the economy alive because of all the new fire stations they were building. As a result of all those big, giant developments, many of them were, you know, during the uh, um, subprime mortgage crisis. So this is really for big stuff. Um, this is my observation. We live in a town of, a small town of 13,000 people. And we have four LA County stations in a small town of 13,000 people, which if you think about that ratio of fire station to individual, it's probably superior to any town in the county of Los Angeles, I would say. It's a legacy really because uh, this was part of unincorporated Los Angeles County and we're sparsely populated, although we have a big area. So the other thing is that the population of Malibu hasn't grown in 30 years which is longer than we've been a city. So I think that, I'm, although I understand what you're saying, the, these type of fees are really to, when you're going out to a place that there are no homes and building giant developments, it's to ensure that those new developments do have, you know, appropriate fire station construction and protection, et cetera. So I hear what you're saying, but I think it, it's because we're in a town that's only, hasn't grown, 
in population in 30 years, which is the entire history of our town that, and we're served by four stations in a small town of 13,000, that if the need were to arise, and if we were to turn into Newport Beach by the sea in the future, because of those fees that would be generated with that, we would probably get some new fire stations. But I think for us, it's things haven't really changed since we've become a city. I appreciate that, Rick. It's, uh, it's just good to hear it from the, from the resource that's best at the table here on that stuff. I appreciate that very much. We, yeah, we don't get big housing subdivisions out here. Uh, one subdivision in New Hall or Santa Clarita is 500 to 1,000 homes. That's half our population. And I get it now that I see how it works. Thanks for that explanation. Anyone else? Okay. Do we, do we know precisely approximately how much money uh, developers in our community are putting into this on an annual basis? I do not have that number for you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, definitely when you look over here and you look at all the pending projects, it's clear that none of them are. If think, you just want to talk about the developer, the development that has happened in Malibu in the past year, you're only talking about a, possibly a handful of homes. Uh, the majority has been a lot of rebuilt. So the fire protection district has not collected those amounts. We are very close to approving La Paz, which is a commercial development that it will include 10 buildings and in a subterranean garage. I will think that is the biggest development that has happened on the city of Malibu in the past year and a half, two years. And with the total square Whatever. foot area for that is, it's gonna be approximately, we're talking about approximately 20,000 square feet. La Paz is only 20,000 square feet? Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's, it's, had, it's maybe like 120,000 100, square feet. But if you talk about um, 97 cents per square feet. $327,000. Yeah. 127,000 square feet. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I it's this has come up, I think, you know, over the years many times, and it's just odd to me that we don't see the dollars spent here. It's not that I want to, like, not fund the fire department. It would just be great to see that money get spent in our city. That's all I'm saying. Well, I think if you, for example, well, we've contemplated in the past, you know, replacing Fire Station 80 at the potential of maybe selling some property to the city or to the county and doing that, that's where that money would go. That money would pay for the construction of that thing. And, you know, Fire Station 71 was rebuilt. So that's that. Did that money. come from this? I, I don't know, but I assume so. Yeah, I don't think, I don't, I believe that that money was not allocated to that when that happened. But I don't remember that. Well, we don't know, so let's find out. All right, so do we want to move forward with this or do we want to? Would someone like to make a motion? Kibosh I'll, this. I'll make a I'll motion. Make a motion. I'll, I'll second his motion. Do we hear the motion first? To approve the staff recommendation. Second that approval motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, on to item 4B. Do we have a staff report, please? Yes. Good evening, Mayor Fair and Council. My name is Christine Shen, and I'm here to present the draft locking bin ordinance. Its desired outcome is to improve the cleanliness of trash areas, prevent the presence of rodents, and discourage the use of rodenticides. To require locking lids, the drafted ordinance includes new definitions such as bin, padlock, and lock bar. The drafted ordinance requires commercial and industrial solid waste bins between one and six cubic yards to have double walled plastic lids, lock bars, and padlocks. The lids of these bins must be shut and locked at all times. Currently, the city does not have a franchise agreement with any waste hauler, so it does not have control over the fees for locking lids. Our waste haulers have estimated that there will be a one-time fee around $100 for welding the lock bar to the bin and a monthly reoccurring fee up to $10 per pickup for servicing locked bins. 
For example, a business with six times per week pickup will pay up to an additional $240 per month for each bin. Since this item was last discussed at Council January 27th, the three environmental program staff have conducted 80 dumpster area inspections and given 23 notices. Um, worth noting that of the 23 notices, 70% were given to restaurants, which include cafes and grocery stores. To continue with the increased frequency of inspections while fulfilling the adopted work plan, the city can pay for contract staff to conduct additional solid waste monitoring. Historically, the protocol has been for city staff to inspect restaurants twice a year and any business in response to complaints. And staff will continue with the twice per year inspections of restaurants and is seeking the council's direction on the frequency of inspections. For additional monitoring of all 70 restaurants, it will cost approximately $3,000. For monitoring of all 130 commercial businesses in Malibu, it will cost approximately $5,850. Based on the council's direction, the budget may be adjusted accordingly. Thank you, and staff and our solid waste haulers are available for any questions. Thank you, Christine. Okay, uh, we have public speaker cards, and I do want to say um, at this time we're not going to take any more speaker slips on this item. All right, uh, the first speaker is Judy Villablanca, followed by Joel Schulman, followed by Pat Healy. Good evening. Uh, thank you for finally getting the Lidlock passed. I just have a very brief comment. Um, I wanted to just comment on the frequency of the inspection. Twice a year is not enough. I mean, based on what uh, Poison Free Malibu has presented before, there's quite a uh, violation rate. And so I think for the first year, I would suggest you do it four times a year for the first year of the ordinance, three times a year for the second year, and then you know, based on the rate of violations, you could go down from there. And I think um, Poison Free Malibu can had also sent you an email. I just wanted to publicly support that fines were not specified in the ordinance and there need to be significant fines uh, so that this actually gets enacted. Um, this is a major ordinance to stop our rodent problem, which we all know is a bad one. Um, we've now banned rodenticide, so it's even more critical we do this right. So I think, um, adequate inspections and adequate fines are needed to make it work. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Joel Shulman, followed by Pat Healy, followed by Georgia Goldfarb. Right, yeah. Um, at the uh, January 27th meeting where this was passed, uh, the issue of timely and serious fines w was a big emphasis. And um, it, it's not in the ordinance, and it looks like it's business as usual which we absolutely do not want for this situation. Uh, just to remind you, I, I actually transcribed some of the video, and uh, Jefferson started it off saying, um, without some enforcement, without the potential for fines, if we don't fine, we can't enforce. With a fine, maybe they'll get behind taking better care of their dumpsters and doing the proper business behavior. So getting the fine can also pay back the code enforcement. You're concerned about the budgeting. Karen was impressed by uh, the city of Boulder with its uh, bear-proof dumpsters. Uh, Boulder, that's a big crackdown. I didn't know about that. No warnings. Uh, I don't know if we're there yet. In my mind, I am. So very quick enforcement was on Karen's mind. Skyler, I would say you get a one pass on the warning letter if your bins are not locked or they're left open. After that, it's a citation. Uh, Mikey, uh, I do think we do need to put a fine schedule because anything like a business, your alarm goes off, you get one warning, it goes off again because you're not taking care of it, they start fining you because it's a nuisance. Um, Mikey continued emphasizing that let's actually determine something. Uh, we have a, a consensus on the fine program too, as a, as a question. Skyler sort of answered. I think Christy will come back with some elements of that. I would suggest that you get a warning and that should be part of the uh, option and everyone agreed with that. 
and then Jefferson going back to the uh, the budget. I guess we're back to penalty, which we could start to draft to educate people. And I think after a warning letter that we go to court enforcement and make it revenue neutral and make it uh, uh, make it some kind of fine. These people have got to start behaving. That's where we're headed. And to remind you, um, if you go to the city of Boulder website, not that we should copy it, but just as an example, um, right on there uh, uh, where they discuss the, uh, the bear problem. Uh, no warnings, uh, fines for noncompliance, code enforcement officers are issuing fines, violators will not receive warnings, officers may issue tickets in person or give citations to property owners via email or printed notification. The fines are $100 first offense, $250 second offense, $500 for the thir third offense. So please let's um, complete what was started at the January 27th City Council meeting and make some clear, rapid uh, warnings and fines, uh, not business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Pat Healy, followed by Georgia Goldfarb. Good evening, Council. Um, you have my written comments. I'm representing the Malibu Co Coalition for Solid Growth, and uh, the ordinance that's proposed for tonight doesn't have any definition of what a hardship is for an exemption when uh, somebody doesn't have to put, I guess, locked dumpsters because of hardships. So there should be some definition of what that is. And again, there is no fine schedule. and um, Four people who are supporters of, four, of slow growth this weekend was pouring through all the city websites trying to find where the fine schedules are for, for this, and there's none in there. And so I think you have to have hefty fines. Uh, it just says, as I think it's in section 1.10 of the municipal code, but that doesn't do anything. And in even a more general way, it's very hard to find any of the fines for any of the things that you have um, prohibited in the city. And I think the public and all of you should have a list of what fines are for which, which, which violation. And uh, they should be hefty to make, to make a difference to make people follow the law. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Georgia, Georgia Goldfarb. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just uh, wanted to let you know that I do support the fines. Um, I think it's pretty clear that business and everybody in the community is aware of that the dumpsters are overflowing and that the current method is not adequate. They could have uh, somehow secured their trash, but they didn't, and they know what happens. The rodents come, and then the rodents are eat pesticide and rodenticide, and then the predators eat the rodents, and then they get sick and die. And everyone knows what happens, and yet so many people aren't changing. That's why I think the fines are going to be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure we have council comments. Who would like to go first? Skyler. I just have a question for Trevor. Um, do we need to specify the fine structure in this part of the ordinance at this time? It's um, Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump over your um, finish. But it, it is already subject to the administrative fine schedule, the same as any other administrative fine in the city. So I, and what are those? I thought Just it was 100, 250, 500. If someone can confirm, that's the right amount. But and then every um, instance after that would be an additional 500 for every day or violation that if exists after that. we wanted to change that or to be clear about that specific to this ordinance, is now the time to do that? Or do we have to bring something else back to do that? You could. <laughs> You have the option of either you can deal with it when the fine schedule comes back every year, or you can specify that this is subject to the administrative fine penalties and specify a specific fine um, for violations here. It's up to you, but there already is a fine in place for these administrative um, citation violations. If you want to adjust what that is, you can do that now, or you can do it later with the fine schedule. You can adjust it at any time you want. Okay. Um, Yolanda. I just need to add to that. Uh, yes, you, you can add it to the uh, municipal code. The only caveat with that is that 
if in a future year or two you would like to increase those fees, we will need to come back to you <coughs> and change that. A good way to go about it is um, add it to the fee schedule that is going to be adopted um, by the next fiscal year, um, specifically on this uh, dumpster lid, and we can implement it. Uh, then, and the fee schedule gets revised every year. So you have two options. So essentially that would come back to us and we could update that before this would actually even be enforced. Yes, the fee schedule comes before the council um, roughly at the end of April, early yeah. May every yeah. year. Okay. Um, I think it would be wise to just put in there that I think it, I still believe it's wise to give somebody a, a warning before you're issuing any form of a citation with this. And I think it would be wise for um, the city to budget for having probably four inspections over the first year um, at a minimum um, just so that we have the funds set aside to uh, or the appropriated to, to handle that and I think we again have to focus on how we're educating the public um, with their waste partners uh, in locking these that's I think the, the, we want this to be successful and I think that's the way to do it so that's what that's where I'm at Councilmember Peak, I just want to make sure that you know that if you make changes to the ordinance this evening, it's going to have to come back again for first reading. It won't go on. Okay. Understand. We're, we're trying to move things along. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Thank you, Karen. Um, so, in the process of this, we're trying, we're educating ourselves as well as the dumpster dudes that are here. Appreciate you guys coming again. Um, oh, sorry. I mean, dumpster providers. So um, the reason we're taking our time, uh, I was, you know, on item 11 of the, um, the recorded minutes that we really didn't get into this other than discussion. So just telling you that staff has done their homework and we appreciate the efforts that you have put out there. Uh, Christine, you're doing a terrific job on this. Thank you. So it's up to us here at this counter to tell the staff what we want to see and how we want to do it. And I think that's where we are on this one. But you did great work, and thanks again, dumpster gentlemen. Um, we'll talk in detail now. You want to say something? Sure. Um, I have a, a question that's related, not related to this. So I don't want to go off far off field here, but have we ever looked at or talked about a franchise agreement on solid waste hauling? Not that I can remember, the, maybe the city attorney. There have been ongoing negotiations about a potential um, uh, exclusive franchise agreement that's been under negotiation. Um, I think environmental health has been taking the lead on that. Uh, it's been, version drafts have gone back and forth, but nothing is imminent at this point. Very curious about that. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think I'm not sure the best way I'll defer to other people here, but we should make sure the fee schedule is added. And I think we pretty much come up with it. I would agree. You get one warning and the 100 to 50, 500. I mean, I hate to go there. I just, and I hate for the expense to our local businesses that this incurs, but it's just, it's just, I think every city has to do this. We just have to be there somehow. Um, I'd like to figure out a way to make it up to our local businesses, and I'm not sure what that is, but I'm, maybe I'll hear from them and they'll come up with some ideas. But I just think, I, I just think we have no choice at this point. It's just, it's been going on. It's just our culture is very messy in our businesses, and we need to make sure we clean that up. We need, yes, the civic responsibility in the city of Malibu. The visitors that come here, 13 million a year, need to see that we're taking care of our issues. And I think a letter is fair. I think uh, for the first year, as Skylar had mentioned, quarterly inspections, we get the program started. This will only be expensive if you're not taking care of your dumpsters. If you're behaving and taking care of your dumpsters, uh, then you're never going to see the code enforcement officer or the fines or the penalties. So I know at several of the buildings, I see great behavior. Um, I'm on my walk by behavior check on Nobu. The, you know, they're good players. Um, so there are buildings, and one of the dumpster gentlemen had mentioned that there are some good players and some bad ones. We just need to start telling the bad ones, get on board, 
and behave like the other businesses because if you take one restaurant and then compare it to another, they still have the same overhead costs. They still have the same things that are consumer driven to make their restaurants successful. And they will be sharing in this if they comply with the dumpster behavior, they'll never see a fine. But I think without fines, we're just going to get the old, oh, that's his problem or that's her problem. And I'm tired of seeing these people defer it to somebody else. And it's, it's not the dumpster dudes. It's not their problem. They're just picking it up and hauling it away. This is behavior at the site. So I think we need to throw something in there in the way of a, of a fine schedule. Um, go ahead, Skyler. I'll wait. I had a, a question. I know that this is uh, the way it's written is to be implemented on in the beginning of June 2020. And I just wanted to hear from Mike or Gabe as to the, that's something that's workable within your guys' schedule with getting people out to add the welding on all of those uh, dumpster containers. Yeah, good evening. Mike Smith, Waste Management. So that was our goal. You know, we've been talking about this for more than a year now, and it just continues to wind on. There's still another meeting beyond this one. So we haven't even really gotten a clear message that it's going to happen, you know, at this certain point in time. So we've been, you know, as we exchange containers, we've been preparing for this and putting on locking devices when we can. But, of course, we, we need to do a blanket conversation with all of our customers. We've been talking with city staff about this, too, on the communication because it's going to take multiple letters and a visit because you don't always get the person who's touching the trash bin on the phone or on the bill. So the sooner there's a decision made, then we can kind of start the clock. We understood a year ago that was your goal kind of laughed about how much time we needed we kind of negotiated right here what it would be but you know we're six months beyond that at least right now so you know the sooner we get a clear picture the faster we can react but if this is to be implemented you guys are can definitely implement it by june this year well it'll be a push at this point it'll be a push if the next meeting it has to be one more meeting for this this won't be the final is there another one the end of march early april I think it'd be a second, another reading of the ordinance, but yeah. Okay. So at that point, it'll be ready, set, go. So it's letters, campaigns, and is there going to be exemptions for folks? Is there not? There's a few other variables. I mean, our plan is to, you know, act as quickly as possible. We've identified the areas of concern. I think all would notice that there's been a, a pretty good effort between our drivers, both companies, and the customers to get them aligned with what's going on. There's been letters from the city. There's been code enforcement. I mean, the behavior has improved. The locking lids on every container are not there, but the behavior has improved. And we're seeing to it, both UWS and ourselves, that we, we trend in this direction. So, I mean, will we have it all done by that day? It'll be tough. But we're you gonna can do work towards best. that. <laughs> we know where you're at. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, the, is there a consensus from council as to we want to change or go with our regular administrative fines? Do we want to wait till that comes up before council in the spring? Or do you guys want to put some specific language in here and have this come back again? I think it's good to get this show on the road. These guys need a final decision on what they're going to do. So I'm a little confused. Are there fines or are there not fines? Absolutely, there, there are fines. This is subject to the administrative um, administrative penalties provision of Chapter 1.10, which has administrative fines attached to it um, for the schedule adopted every year. But that, again, is administrative decision. It's, it's the same as if Doug issues a citation for other violations of the municipal code. There are fines attached to that. It would be the same fines that you would attach for a violation of other uh, provisions of the municipal code that are subject to the administrative citation provisions. The administrative citation provisions are what people think of when you get a ticket from the citation from the city. The other option is criminal enforcement, which we rarely do. Um, and that involves criminal penalties and appearances in court um, prosecution. So if we have a repeat offender, they may be criminally prosecuted. It seems silly, but I guess it could happen. Yes. Um, again, the hope with this would be compliance. So if this is dealt with administratively, Trevor, essentially, um, you know, ABC Pizza is out there and their bin is not locked. So our staff goes by, they notice, hey, the thing's not, it doesn't have a lock on it. So they take a photo of it 
I would imagine, and yep. they contact the business owner via email or try certified letter saying, here's your thing, lock your lid, and uh, get in compliance. Then we go out there a month later, and the same problem's still happening, and now they get hit with a $100 fine. Problem's still happening the next month, and then they get hit with a $250 fine. Or if it's a daily thing, you know, if the next day you come back and they're not locking it, you can... But, yeah, so it's, it, is that citation for staff something that's simple to take care of? Yeah, it's, it's the standard practice that code enforcement takes for all violations of the municipal code. Great. I'd like to make a motion to approve item 4B. Uh, well, did we uh, consider the inspection uh, criteria as well um, in part of the proposal? Because you did mention that, and I think so, we need to have additional inspections, at least for the first calendar year, from what, the start of the uh, draft. So, yeah, okay, well... In my motion, uh, can we direct s staff to approve budgeting for quarterly inspections of... We can do that without that being in the ordinance, if Great. that's the direction you'd like. Great. And, and is the fine schedule the 100, 250, That's what I, I, don't, I don't know. That's what I believe. Can someone confirm that that's the amount? Doug's not here. Uh, off the top of my head, I believe that's correct. I can certainly provide If, if that's that. not the schedule, then uh, the item can be brought back to council to advise you that the schedule is different, and then it can be, the item can be reintroduced. Will do. Okay. I, I just want to say a couple things. Um, regarding uh, the quotes from all of us about fines, um, I looked back for the exact language of the motion that we had passed in January. And uh, the action item reads, directed staff to bring back an ordinance to amend Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 8.32 to require locking double-walled plastic lids on dumpster bins that are kept locked at all times for commercial solid waste, organic waste, and recycling. So um, the staff did do exactly what the council uh, moved on, and that was what I just read. Um, as far as the fines, I, I do have a concern that um, if the speakers tonight looked on our website and could not find the fine schedule, maybe we need to make that more readily available on the website. I'll take care of that. Thank you. Okay. So back to uh, our motion. We had a motion. Do we have a second? A second. All in favor? Uh, so the, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Trevor, do you need to read it, or do you want yes, to? Okay, thank you. Read the title. So that would be a motion to adopt ordinance number 462, an ordinance of the City of Malibu determining the project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and amending sections 8.32020 definitions, 8.32600 containers for garbage, market, refuse, and rendering waste, 8.32660 containers, commercial and industrial, and 8.32720, violation penalty, and adding section 8.32665, implementation to chapter 8.32, solid waste and recyclable materials in Title Eight health and safety, to require commercial slash industrial property occupants to, to lock solid waste containers, bins, and other equipment. And then it would also be to direct staff to uh, perform inspections quarterly in the, in the following year. Is that correct? That was the proposal, Trevor. I don't want to interrupt yours, but it was a quarterly for the first year, starting when the draft is accepted. Okay. Does that reflect the motion in the second? Yes. That is correct. Okay, we had a, a motion, a second? Yes? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving Thank you, on. Gentlemen. Thanks, gents, for coming down here. Appreciate it. So item 4C. Do we have a staff report? Good evening, council members. Um, item 4C is the fire resistant landscape ordinance. Back in January, the city council conducted a first reading, and um, after receiving, and then actually conducted the approved it and uh, conducted the second reading and received comments um, suggesting some revisions to the ordinance. The council directed staff to analyze those um, proposed revisions and um, 
return with a, a, new sec, a new first reading of the ordinance. So that's what we're here to do tonight. Um, I can go through each of the items if you like. Um, staff is basically, we proposed um, one, let's see, there we go. There was a, a suggestion that um, some clarity be provided about the um, definition of shade structures. So we've done that by adding the letter or the word A. Um, there was a suggestion that um, the provisions regarding mulch that are in the ordinance um, are at odds with each other. Um, I think that's a matter of how the reader is reading the section. However, staff did um, propose um, some, I, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day. Um, okay, here we go. So in, in the middle of this section, we added the word flammable to clarify that it's um, flammable mulch that has to be used non-continuously. Um, but the, uh, there was a follow-up suggestion that that wasn't clarifying enough. So um, we also can add additional language referencing that there are two sections on mulch. And so if you would like to include that, that's what this would look like. So this is the first area in the ordinance where there's a description of mulch and how to use mulch and that's pertaining to evapotranspiration. That was in the existing ordinance. And then this is the new language we proposed and with the clarification we proposed, the additional clarification back in that first section is just to refer the reader to the second section so that they know that there are two things that deal with mulch. Okay. Um, the The next uh, section regarding structure setbacks. Um, I think there's confusion here because uh, staff did understand the comments provided by the letter. Um, the, the issue raised was that um, the language in the ordinance calls for um, a 10 foot uh, setback between main residential buildings and only a six foot setback between accessory buildings and a main residential building. And the, the concern was that accessory dwelling units, ADUs, are both an accessory use and a residential use. Um, that is true that accessory dwelling units are um, a residential use, however, they are inherently accessory. And so the six foot setback is what would apply. Um, the building code allows for a six foot setback for accessory dwelling units from a main residence. So um, the language is fine as written as far as that goes. If the council would like to add an additional, um, you know, add language to make ADUs set back 10 feet from the main residence, you can do that. Um, it could make it harder for people to site ADUs on their properties if they have to maintain a 10 foot setback from a main residence. It's up to you. I think the language is actually fine as written, but if you would like to have a 10 foot setback from um, ADUs and a main residence, I'd be happy to add that in. And then the last uh, clarification, um, council did not direct this um, when you had the, the original hearing on the item, but um, this is the proposed language that we included to address the proposed um, 10 foot setback for landscaping on either side of a roadway or driveway. Um, so this is the language that was included in the staff report. And I believe those are, those are that, that is the sum of the, the changes that we're proposing at this time. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Okay, yeah. thank you, Bonnie. Uh, public comments, first is Robert Kerbeck. You have four minutes. Thank you, Chris Frost. And uh, next is Georgia Goldfarb. Um, hi, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for having me. And um, thank you for this ordinance or proposed ordinance. Um, as someone who has done a bit of writing about the Woolsey Fire, I know how hard this is. I want to thank the city manager and I want to thank the staff 
and this woman here, I didn't catch your name. I'm the planning director, Bonnie Blue. Hi, Bonnie. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice Thank to meet you for you. your work. I know how hard this is. This is hard work. Um, I personally think it's the most important work that you guys might um, have in front of you tonight and maybe most nights because, as you know, what we all went through, we never want to go through again. So um, I've gone through this a little bit, and I just have a couple of questions. Um, one thing I don't see mentioned anywhere are wood piles, um, wood piles, large wood piles being left near people's homes um, are obviously a fire hazard, and I would love to see that there was some way where wood piles were not allowed to be next to homes. Um, another thing um, that I see here, and I just have a question, is um, it's page let me see what page it is here. It's page 19, Bonnie. Um, and there's a thing here. It says, fire protection standards, one, planning restrictions. A, palm trees are prohibited. B, trees and shrubs are prohibited between zero and five feet from a structure. C, the following species are prohibited within 50 feet of structures. And it lists a bunch of um, types of trees. And then D says, non-continuous planting of trees and shrubs except those in A and B and above is allowed between five feet and 50 feet. And I was confused by that. I thought that would mean non-continuous planting of trees and shrubs except those in A and C. Um, and that might just be me. Yeah, but, it should say A and C, you're right. Okay, actually. thank you. Um, so this is really a great start. It's fantastic, and I want to applaud everybody. I would just like to say a couple of things. One thing I don't see here is we've got the following species are prohibited within 50 feet. Palm trees are prohibited. Love it. Um, eucalyptus trees and pine trees. I saw those trees catch on fire when I was there trying to save my house. I saw them catch. I saw those trees burn down, not that house, but the house two houses over. So one guy's house burned someone else's house down. And we all saw that over and over in the fire. No one should have the right to burn my house down because of their trees or burn your house down because of their trees. So this 50 feet thing, I'd like to see those trees banned. Um, and part of the thing I worry about is the 50 feet thing is we have these mass plantings. So we could have 20 pine trees 55 feet from a structure. And I could drive you around Malibu and show you examples of that. We've all seen it, where there are groves of eucalyptus trees and groves of pine trees that might be 55 feet from a structure. And so that's something I think we could explore. I know we have a limit on the number of dogs we can have in a house. I feel like there should be, if, if we're going to allow pine and eucalyptus, you should get one, OK? That's it. You get one. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to move on, but I'm just going to tell you in all my travels with my book, the question I am asked most often, the mayor of Los Angeles asked me this question last week when I met him, the New York Times has asked me to write about it, is they want to know what Malibu is doing, what laws are they passing to make Malibu more fire safe. This is it. So please, please, this is a legacy for all of you guys, for our city, for the future generations. And the final thing in my 19 seconds here is, it seems like this only concerns future homes, future homes that are built. And that means that all of these changes will not manifest for a generation. And I don't think we have the time to wait. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next is Georgia Goldfarb and then Pat Healy. Oh, okay, so four minutes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, let me not take that. Hi again, thank you. Um, so I have some specific comments about some different items, and I'll just go through them. Um, one on the roadway clearance, um, I was a little confused because, in fact, all vegetation is flammable. So I'm concerned that it's misleading and confusing to kind of introduce the concept that some vegetation is not flammable. Um, so there was that. And then as to removing all plants from uh, the roadways except for the cultivated plants, as you described there, um, I, I don't think that native pollinator plants should be removed from the roadways. Um, generally, they flourish in disturbed soils, roadways, um, and they serve not only to enhance the habitat and contribute to the seed store for the wildlands, they serve as food for our diminishing insect populations, but they are a source, of course, of beauty. 
Um, in addition, natives suppress the growth of non-native grasses and mustards, which truly are fire accelerants and must be continuously removed. So if you weed whack once, um, they'll just grow up right by the roadside. It's prolific in my community in Big Rock. Um, and these non-natives, as I said, persist throughout the fire season and increase the risk, the fire risk, not only on the roadside, but by seeding the chaparral. And this is extremely concerning to me um, because when there's some dieback in chaparral, at this point, what's filling in are the non-native grasses and mustard. And that is just going to increase the fire risk. Um, so, I mean, that's just a fact of fire ecology. Uh, removal of natives, therefore, increases the risk of roadside fire. Um, and I think it does have an effect on, adverse effect on the environment and shouldn't be exempt from CEQA. Um, you might consider that. I know it seems small, but I just don't see a lot of pollinators blooming, except a lot on the roadsides. Um, the alternative is to poison the roadsides, which I don't think any of us want. Um, so I would just uh, like you to revisit that and see if there's some language you could put in to preserve, you know, the ancelia and the lupin and uh, those kinds of plants. Um, so planning requirements. So um, in defining landscape areas up to 50 feet from the structure, I don't think this recommendation, as I understand it, comports with the best practices described in From the House Outward, that the first 100 feet should have some irrigation. Uh, and the differential be, being between 30 feet, which has more irrigation, and the next 70 feet, which still has some irrigation. Uh, then there's mulch. Um, if mulch is required in the first 30 to 100 feet from this structure, that truly may not be within the financial means for many. Um, so I don't know if the council is, has some subsidy to come up with, but that's a lot of money to put in. Um, then the tree height restriction. Um, between 20 to 50 feet of a power line uh, is so severe that eliminates you, it may eliminate use of many native trees, such as oak and sycamore. So where's the science behind this? Based on my conversation with the PUC, there is no science regarding restricting plant heights related to power lines. I would say, given climate change and the moderating effect of trees on climate and household heat, this restriction is counterproduction. The solution is to bury the power lines. Um, and then the another section, uh, fuel modification and brush otherwise known as chaparral habitat clearance, should use the best current wildland sense, science, not fire department regulations. There's a reference in there uh, from the 1990s. Oops, best practices are required if we are to preserve chaparral habitat. Um, otherwise, you get the non-natives. And I would say prescribed burns are absolutely contraindicated in the chaparral, according to the consensus of wildland scientists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, council, any comments? Uh, th she talked about um, mulch being required. I think it's really the types of mulch that you can use. You know, it's not saying that you're required to have mulch. It's just saying that the, right? I mean, there's certain well, types you can use close to the house and certain types that you can use not, you know, continuously, but um, sparsely or whatever the wording is between 30 and 50 feet. It doesn't say you shall have mulch or does it? Well, okay, so um, the, the ordinance that this amendment um, to add fire protection standards to that ordinance existed. It's our landscape water conservation ordinance and it was based on the um, state model water landscape ordinance from you know several years ago that the state mandated that all communities adopt and we've we adopted it and it's been amended a couple of times when the state has asked or you know required amendments. Um, mulch is required in um, non-turf and non like ground cover areas based on that state ordinance. Um, but mulch, as you say, can be a bunch of different kinds of materials. It can be gravel, it can be DG, it doesn't have to be um, bark or those kinds of things. Um, but it was um, a requirement in the ordinance as it 
stand already. And so the standards that we've added under the fire protection standards just talk about um, non-continuous use of flammable mulch. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Oh, thank you. Jefferson? Um, I appreciate you do, putting this forward, Bonnie, and then uh, adopting some of the language based upon the former commissioner, planning commissioner, Craig Hill, which he got into the detail of it as some of our speakers here this evening have. And I reach out to you and all of you that are doing the detail work that sometimes we overlook at the council. And uh, it's much appreciated and it's not overlooked. And you can see with, with what Bonnie has done is she's adopted to some of those comments. And uh, I appreciate that modification on, on behalf of the former planning commissioner. And uh, he was into the weeds on this. And uh, it looks like you've, you know, satisfied some of those comments. Um, if, if I may, I would address um, Ms. Goldfarb's comments about the roadway clearance um, provisions and, and natives. Um, one of the reasons that staff didn't include anything to address this in the first um, ordinance that came before you is because the fire department does have a standard and we didn't want to get into a situation where we were um, conflicting with the fire department standards or, or something like that. This language is pretty much based on the fire department's standard. Um, so it, it does include some terms and things that, you know, we might not have said all flammable vegetation for the reason that she stated, but um, I didn't want to have something that was at odds with what the fire department is already doing. Um, so you, you have the option of just relying on the fire department to um, Impo to uh, administer this standard, or we can include it in our ordinance as we've presented here um, so that it's in two places. But that's, I just wanted to mention why we didn't include it in the first place. I think, I think what's tricky here too is that every lot is not the same and, and it's really, from what I've learned, and I've learned so much from people like Georgia and and Pat and and Linda is that it's also the condition of your plants as much as anything else. So that, that makes it really tricky. And I saw in my neighborhood, which have full fire attack, eucalyptus did not catch fire, which really shocked me that they were really well pruned, pruned and trimmed and no loose bark and no debris underneath. It took me two months to figure that out. I was like, why didn't they burst into flames? Palm trees sure did. <laughs> Um, but the, it's really knows, and I think about my backyard, which was accidentally fire escaped in a way, sort of halfway, I didn't know what I know now. Same thing, nothing caught fire, except the one cushion I left outside, and it was filled with holes. So it's, it's this, this is, it gets tricky when you get into, into the weeds, so to speak. Um, I, I have a feeling Ultimately, I'm not not trying to push anything on, but I have a feeling this some this ordinance is going to be updated as we go. I think it's going to need to be because I think we're learning more and more, and um, and it is tricky to adopt an ordinance that covers the vast variety of properties we have in Malibu. It's tricky. Yeah. Um, when we first presented this to the planning commission, that our that it was intended to be kind of our first cut at this, knowing that the council and the community are interested in a, a, a you know, a, a full slate of strategies to deal with fire hardening and fire escaping, fire proofing, whatever you want to call it. So we, this was kind of a starting point um, and it was our thought that yes, based on council direction and priorities and all those sorts of things that we could easily um, incorporate that into our work plan and come back with um, future iterations or additional uh, phases of this. Um, and with respect to wood piles, that's something that um, if you wanted to go ahead and approve tonight's draft um, with the changes that we've talked about and have the second reading, we could bring back um, fairly soon something that addresses wood piles or if you want to think about that one and, and you know add it to the work plan, however you want to prioritize it. But if you wanted to have us get this kind of moving um, towards where we can implement it, we can bring back something addressing wood piles. 
And wood piles are not allowed within five feet of your house, by the way. <laughs> if I could just jump in to sort of uh, to echo what Bonnie has said, you know, we do really want to try and get some rules in effect that we can start um, implementing um, and working with the community on. We think that's very important. Um, just a quick rehash of the schedule. This was first brought up to and given direction to council um, in January a year ago. Uh, went to Zeracis. It took us some time, given our workload, to get it through this, the process. Went to Zeracis in October, came to council in October, went to the Planning Commission in November, came back to the council this January for first reading, came back uh, two weeks later for second reading, and then uh, you all requested some changes, so it's back in front of you again for first reading. Um, I just would love to be able to see us move this along, and as Bonnie said, we can always bring it back and make it better. Yeah, and uh, wood piles are not really landscaping; they're just stuff that you do on your property, and they are part, they are on the you know the inspection thing for the fire department that they're supposed to be, I think, it's thirty or fifty feet away from your house. So um, this is, uh, and I want to thank the speakers for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerbick and Georgia. Always good to hear you chime in. But it's part of an ongoing, it is an important document, very important document, but it's part of an ongoing cultural change, you know, that happens. And we want it to be cool, you know, to have your house be safe. And we want it to be, you know, a part of the normal rules. And this is a, this is a big part of that. And th <coughs> these changes have been going on for years. You know, the, during the 93 fire, their, the brush clearance uh, procedures were not as as in place prior to that, and then after that they were, and they were pretty diligent about it. In the 96 fire, there was a lot less homes lost as a result of that. So this is an ongoing thing that will be improved upon with time, and this is just another step along the way, and I do agree with Mikey. I think this is, you know, it's, it's let's get it going, and if we want to make modifications to it later, sure, no problem. I think it's going to be not one of those things that collects dust on our shelves. It's going to be a, a central core of what makes Malibu resilient and safe as we move forward. So I appreciate your positive comments about that. So I'd uh, like to make a motion to approve this. Okay, thank you, Rick. Do we have a second? Council Member Wall, can I suggest that the uh, typographical correction be made to oh, Section it, 17? Yeah, and thank you yes, for finding and thank that, you for Robert. that attention to detail. Yes. That would be Section 17.53090C1D. Then it would say the non-continuous planting of trees and shrubs except those in A and C above is allowed between five feet and 50 feet from a structure. And then the other thing, if you would like us to, um, it wasn't in the uh, ordinance attached to your staff report, but the, the second reference, um, or the reference added to mulch being located in, um, later in the ordinance, we, that was something I presented just tonight, so if you want to incorporate that, then we should add that to the motion. We can incorporate the referenced second mulch requirement. I go with that. Okay. And then uh, just to read the title of the ordinance, then it would be to adopt ordinance number 461, an ordinance of the city of Malibu determining the zoning text amendment number 19-004 to be categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and amending the local coastal program, local implementation plan, chapter three, Zoning designations and permitted uses in Chapter 2, definitions in Malibu Municipal Code Title 17 zoning to foster the creation of fire-resistant landscapes and repealing ordinances number 343 and 356, deleting Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 9.22, landscape water conservation, establishing Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 17.53, landscape water conservation and fire protection, and amending Malibu Municipal Code Section 16.24020 to eliminate reference to Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 9.22 citywide. That reflect your motion? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I just wanted to get the nod from Bonnie that we got the corrections that were needed. Yes, and um, just to confirm, um, you do want to include this language that happens to still be on the screen about the um, fire department's roadway yes. clearance provision? Okay. And I think we're the six feet thing is okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Yes. yes. Sorry, sorry. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 And just a last comment. I, I think you're, what you're saying about pollinator gardens and natives is important. I would love to strategize with you how we can, what we can do there and, and going forward into the future because it, it is really important. It's really tricky stuff too. Um, so that, 
something I'd love to engage in conversation about, absolutely. Can I add to that comment to the comment? Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, on the 10-foot setbacks for the ADUs, I'm sure we can address that again because that is important. Um, I know lot line adjustments are always coming forward to you guys because now the ADUs is going to be considered. So the 10-foot setback, I think the reason that that's there is so that people can't just put the ADU in, tie it to their homes with 5-foot setback, and 10-foot is that separation. A cord of wood, I mean, close to a house in proximity, five cords of wood is something else. A cord of wood spread out properly isn't that invasive, and it isn't that easy to catch fire if it's low setting. But we'll get into the, the, the meat and potatoes of this as we move forward. Thank you for your work, and thanks for all the comments that you folks brought. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 7A. Take it away, Mikey. I appoint David Weil as my permanent replacement to the Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. All right. Moving on. There's no Do sort we, of vote needed or anything? No, it doesn't need okay. Motion, yeah. Okay. So now we're moving on to 7C. Oh, excuse me. 7B. I'm sorry. I can talk about this ah, one. 7B, thank you. Yeah, there's a gentleman who's listed in here by the name of James Ottilie, Malibu resident, whose wife is from um, Hunan province, right next to the province where all the problems are having. And uh, it this may not be quite as um, urgent as it was when he first contacted the city to get it in there because at that time it was like everything was in China. It's like let's do everything we can help. And I think as the story unfolds, we realized that all the N95 masks, masks are made in China, you know, and now we've got the problems here. So my recommendation is let's honor his request, which is to send, I think it's a case of 160 of them because they're sending things if he still needs to do it. You know, let, I tried, I reached out to him today, but I didn't hear back from him. I don't have his phone number. I just sent him an email said, hey, you know, let's, let's talk. I want to find out if this is still as as urgent as it was when you first requested it, which I'm, I'm all in favor of doing. So I would, I would um, recommend to the council that let's go ahead and support this, but let, before we do, let's just check with him and see if it's still necessary. You know, maybe it's inappropriate at this point, but let's uh, uh, defer to his judgment on that since his wife is from China and probably has better information on what's going on than we do. Is this the Jamie on Wandermere? I believe so, yeah. First off, thank you, Rick. I uh, just, I know that there was a speaker on this. I think, is Dr. Anderson? Excuse me, we do have a speaker slip. I just wanted to say, um, by accident, I know that she wanted to comment, a public comment earlier. And she's been sitting and waiting patiently, and I was going to try to allow her some more time if needed. It's sort of related to coronavirus. It is related to that. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, you very so, much. Um, yeah, thank you. We just have one speaker here, mm -hmm. Ariana Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. This is my very first city council uh, meeting that I've been involved with, and I've come here before or today because I believe this is a very important and very dangerous risk that is likely to impact our community. So I asked to speak specifically during the portion about the masks because this is something that is, as was mentioned earlier, a very dynamic situation that we should be taking into account. And the reason for this is because the risk is changing for different parts of the world. So the Chinese government has reported that they expect zero cases in Wuhan, which is the epicenter, by the end of March. On the other hand, uh, we know that we have our first case of community transmission as of today. The New York Times has also reported that we have less than 1% of the N95 masks available to use for our health care providers and for our first responders. Recently, within the past two days, a firefighter in Kirkland, Washington, was diagnosed with coronavirus after responding to the cases in the nursing home last week. This suggests that our first responders and our health care providers are likely to be at risk from this without protective uh, equipment 
And I would like to recommend instead that we donate the equipment to our local first responders, including Lost Hill Sheriff Station, the local fire department, or even the Malibu Urgent Care if we see that they have need from it. In addition to that, I do have a uh, more request of the council of whether or not they see any evidence or any risk involved of local increase in our community, and if so, if they would be willing to donate additional resources, including N95 masks, to um, our first responders and healthcare providers locally in Malibu who may need it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, does that conclude your public comments? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, well, I would make a motion to do what Rick wanted to do because he kind of already agreed with someone and he's trying to come up with a better plan. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to say I appreciate your comments. And uh, as a first responder, it's always nice when the public is concerned about the safety of the first responders. But I, so far, I think we have enough N95 masks at least in the county fire department. And but she makes a great point, which is it's changing. You know, when this first thing came out, it was all in China. It's like, hey, let's do whatever, whatever we can to help them. It's now here. It's changing all the time. Our masks all that important. I, I'm not really sure. I'm sure we could probably send them a case and feel good about it. So what I would say is <clears throat> let's get in touch with um, this gentleman and see, you know, if he still needs it and what he's telling us. And uh, I think we can support it. But. I, I suspect the situation has changed dramatically and it may not be as urgent as, as was when he first contacted the city. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I have a question for the city manager. Has the city had any requests for masks from any of the local health care providers or first responders or anyone like that? No, we have not, Mayor. No, no one has asked us for any. This was the only request that we've had. Okay, and the city has, I assume, a supply of masks above and beyond what we're talking about donating? Yes, we do. Um, uh, shortly after, within days after the Woolsey fire, we placed a significant order of masks, um, and we've handed out a lot of those since during the Woolsey fire and in the fires last year. Um, to residents. Um, we do have a lot of masks in our uh, various supply bins. Um, my recommendation, if you're uh, asking for any feedback, would be to um, hold on to many, as many masks as we have. Uh, we know there's going to be another fire season, and I think it's important for us to have those on hand for that. Um, obviously, if first responders need them, um, they could certainly contact us, but at this time, I have not heard from um, either fire or law enforcement or any medical offices uh, who needed them. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, Rick, are you going to try to contact the person who contacted yeah. you and I'll, I'll see if there's still a need? Yes. Okay, yeah. so, so the motion is... To if authorize, needed. Excuse me? If needed. If needed. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay, so that's the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second, second it. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to item 7C. Uh, let's see, All Mikey, right. that's your item. Yay. Thank you. Um, so I, I think everyone, I, I believe, maybe it's just me, but everyone knows about P56 and um, his very untimely death. And the, there's only one other male mountain lion in the entire area now. So obviously the genetic diversity and ability to continue the species is, is on the brink. Um, Following the lead of Henry Stern, Ben Allen, Richard Bloom, uh, Laura Friedman, um, I would like us to send a letter as well to the director of California, to, uh, director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, offering support in the effort to protect the state's mountain lion population. I was pleased also today to see a letter from the Center for Biodiversity, um, Biological Diversity that apparently initially wrote the letter, sent a letter of support for this too. So that that was good. Um, I think this is a no-brainer for our area. 
Um, we are the custodians. Um, we've been working really hard to make a difference, and I just think we need to lend support here. Thank you. We do have two uh, public speaker slips, Judy Villablanca and Joel Schulman. Um, thank you, Council, very much for supporting, I think it was actually my request, to list the Southern California and Central Coastal Mountain Lions as threatened. Thank you, under, Judy. <laughs> thank you. Under the California Endangered Species Act and to stop issuing depredation permits. You know, the um, grizzly bear is the official state animal of California. And before it died out in our state uh, due to human causes, grizzly bears thrived in California, probably in greater numbers than anywhere else in the United States. So every time I see our California state flag, which is sitting up there with the image of the now extinct grizzly bear, I can only think we can do better and really we must do better um, as we now face the potential extinction of mountain lions. Um, the letter from the Center of Biologic Diversity is outstanding. It's signed by 46 supporting organizations that represent probably close to a million people um, and provides an excellent summary of the evidence that they are at increased risk of extinction and the causes. And it also points out that killing lions via depredation permit can actually increase conflicts by disrupting their social structure. But I also want to ask you tonight to do even more than write a letter, uh, which I, I still think that's critical. Um, I think Malibu needs to develop an annual community education program on how to live with wildlife, especially with that 101 overpass coming. Um, we also need to develop city and county regulations for protecting potential prey animals like sheep, llamas um, that are in our city and mountains, and a public process for reviewing issues when they come up and providing non-lethal solutions. There's a lot of great groups that are local that are really more than happy to raise funding and bring hands in to help people build fences, get you know lights, those kinds of things. Um, it just shouldn't be done in the dark, and that's how this depredation permit sadly was issued. And I think the solution is similar to what we learned and we're talking about a lot tonight about wildfires. We have to harden our homes rather than destroy all the chaparral. So I think we also have to prevent lion conflicts by protecting the potential prey animals. Otherwise, you're just going to set it up to happen again and again and again. Um, and that is going to have to happen via education, oversight, and probably regulations, um, more regulations. Um, but I think Malibu can and really should be a leader to protect our mountain lions. Um, and I think this would be a great task for the Environmental Sustainability Commission that we've talked about so many times, because you're going to need some hands to help develop all this. There's a lot of great uh, people in this community and around us that have the resources to help us do this. Um, but I think we need to hit it on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Schulman. I just wanted to thank you for bringing this up. Um, it's sort of uh, an untimely coincidence that this seems to happen when there's a big vote coming up, AB 1788, whatever, a mountain lion dies. I mean, it's like, so this, this uh, April 16th uh, Fish and Game Commission meeting really was set up by the Center for, for Biological Diversity and the Mountain Lion Foundation. They started this process to have the mountain lions be declared endangered in six specific regions of California, including the Santa Monica Mountains. So it would be really great is if like all the, as many as possible of the towns around the Santa Monica Mountains told this, the Fish and Game Commission, yeah, we we're all for it. So that's really powerful. And uh, just to give you a status report, um, uh, you know, Ventura County, uh, led by Linda Parks, passed it a week or two ago. That's great. Um, uh, Agoura, uh, I'm not sure exactly what stage they're at, but at least Buckley Weber and Agoura Hills is working on it. Uh, Al Adam, the mayor of, of Thousand Oaks at the moment, is, said he was, he was going to push it. Uh, we're in contact with a city council person in Ojai. Uh, Westlake Village, we're making an attempt uh, tomorrow at the city council meeting there. I don't know what will happen. But this was really started off by uh, L.A. City, uh, Coretz and, and Rue. Uh, um, in L.A. County, uh, Sheila Kuehl has already written a letter. She's also going to try to get the Board of Supervisors to write a letter. I don't know what stage that's up. And then Mikey uh, mentioned this letter, um, really great letter signed by uh, Henry, Richard Bloom, Ben Allen, and Laura Friedman. So um, it would be great to surround the Santa Monica Mountains with supportive letters. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Have any comments? So is the motion just essentially to support the letter written by the state 
uh, representatives? The motions to send a letter. Right, in support of their letter, or? Well, I mean, it's right here in black and white if you'd like to read it. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is because I think our recommended action is clearer than their letter, you know, because their letter is, it just says, um, can we, uh, are we going to, it, it sounds like what the, what the item is, is no more depredation permits in these areas. And it doesn't sound like their letter is that clearly. So maybe we want to be as clear as we are in the agenda item in support of their letter, you know, because I do think our agenda item is, is clear, which essentially, I mean, they were talking about putting on endangered species. That's got to be like some scientific thing. Whereas I think that the net effect of what we want is no more issuance of those permits in places where they are in such sparse numbers that it's critical, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? I don't know if, if there's some like weird threshold of, of something that, that you have to get past to list something on the Endangered Species Act. You know what I mean? But I think if we just say, don't issue these permits anymore in these areas, that maybe so you want have. the letter to say both, maybe? Yeah, I would say say both, but um, yeah. yeah, probably the way to go. Joel, would you please come up and say yeah, something? This whole depredation issue is really complicated, and I don't think I don't think the city can should do that. It's too it's great. I, I love it, but it's it's it, 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 it's too complicated. I think what we should just do is support the uh, Center for Biological Diversity for this April sixteenth um, uh, Fish and Game Commission. Just say you know you can make this. There's an example. Coretz, the Coretz letter is a good example. For example or the Sheila Kuehl letter, just su support making it an endangered species at this particular vote, at this particular meeting. That's fine. You can do that. You could, you could certainly mention depredation, but w that's really complicated. Okay, that's good to know, because I thought that was the simpler thing to do. Okay, it, it, thank it, you. I agree that would be the best thing, but it's just not practical. So, so which letter is the one you recommend that... Uh, I, 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 I'm not a sure. Take There's a look a at the Coretz letter. Is or it the one that's attached? Or maybe yes. maybe it's the uh, the Henry Stern. It's Denali. the Stern letters was here. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Please give us the, a copy the, the, the of the Give it to you, the, the, <laughs> Just give it to the city clerk. I don't think we have the Coretz letter. This is just the Stern letter. So do you have a preference between the two letters? Do we need to bring back something different because we don't have that in this? Or Trevor, would you like us to just bring back an item with a different letter? Is that what you would prefer? Yeah, I, I don't know that that's necessary. I mean, um, well, Mikey's reviewing it now, so let's give him a moment. That way I can push for the wildlife overcrossing while he's doing that. Uh, appreciate that thought and the Environmental Sustainability Commission that was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers. I'd like to push for that, too, in the future. I can comment on those, but I can't ask for any decisions. But I do get to make the comment now while Mikey's reviewing the letter. We, we can direct the city manager to uh, work with the mayor pro tem to uh, create a letter that either mirrors one of the, either the Coretz letter or the Stern letter or a combination of the two. Would that direction work? Yeah, they're definitely different letters. There's no doubt about that. Um, so, yeah, let's, let, I, w I would like to move on what we have here, too, and then with your help there, Judy, I'd like to bring this item back. So you want to bring a separate item? Separate item. So yeah. uh, then it would be the direction is to send a letter similar to the Stern letter today and then bring back a potential second letter? Yes. On a future agenda? Uh, both, both are def they're definitely vary and... I don't know that I noticed quite that degree, so, but I definitely told Henry we would support him and appreciated what he was doing, so let's follow through on that. And then, absolutely, I communicated with uh, the Center for Biological Diversity today, so this, yeah, this is fantastic. So, okay, yes, I will submit this for 
evidence for the next item. So your motion was to uh, send a letter similar to the Stern letter for now, then to bring back an item on a future agenda. Hey, wait, let, Correct. let me interject here for a second, because Joel did say that this thing, event or whatever, meeting is coming up in April, right? Okay, so maybe rather than putting it off until the next meeting, we could, uh, the mayor could write one, right? If it doesn't have to come back, the mayor maybe could just write one. Does that I work? Mean, I think I'm just trying would... to be expedient here. Now you're talking about bringing it back for another meeting, and th this meeting that he wants to support, which that other letter was for, is some in April. So I don't want to delay it too much. The subject matter of the second letter is very similar to the, the item here, right? I was sending a letter in support. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to, I, I can't compare them both here while I'm sitting here right now, but they're definitely different letters. Um, we still have time if we bring it back on the next agenda before this deadline? Yeah, we still got a meeting in March. Okay. Okay, okay, then let's bring it back and get it perfect. Okay, okay. so then the motion would be to send a letter similar to the Stern letter and bring back an item on the next agenda, um, whether to adopt a letter similar to the Corretz letter. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so who's making that motion? I'll make that motion. Second. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And one last little comment. Yesterday there was a talk here in Malibu on living with wildlife. Sadly, it wasn't very well promoted. <laughs> um, there was about five or six of us here. And um, one really cool, I'll just share one really cool fact about it. They, um, they brought their, Rebecca brought her owl box and her video on the owl box. And uh, the owl box often will take 4,000, up to 4,000 mice and vermin out of, in a year. Out of circulation in a year. Pretty, pretty amazing. And to add to that, the Ventura County assessment on the owl boxes along Rice Avenue in their, in their assumptions and then their proven data it was that it was cheaper to put the owl boxes up than it was to rodenticide. And yeah. that was proven by Ventura County. Yep. And same with raptor poles. So anyhow, that's it. Just wanted to say that we have been trying to educate, but that one didn't need a little better marketing, I think. Okay, so we are on to the final agenda item of the evening, 7D, and this is an update on, um, uh, update from the school district separation ad hoc committee, which is council member Mullen and myself. Um, so Rick, would you like to start? We both said a little bit about it already. Yeah, sure. Uh, so. The long and arduous road of Malibu getting its own school district has been going on for many years. The latest, and I mentioned it briefly in my comments at the beginning, um, big item we're wrestling with which is the uh, parcel tax, which is currently in place and that the city of Santa Monica, well, the, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District was concerned that if the schools were to separate, that that would go away and that they would have to vote on a new one, parcel tax, and of course, as you have to have like a two-thirds majority to get that, and they didn't, they had concerns about their confidence in being able to get that. So what we sought was a legislative solution to um, pass a bit of legislation, very simple language, very simple language, so that if two schools did separate that the tax that's in place, which is, goes in, in perpetuity to support the schools, would be able to just stay in those respective school districts. So we had a meeting um, with the uh, negotiating teams, uh, as I said, qu quickly put together last Tuesday. And then I spoke at the board meeting on Thursday to request their support for this. And um, that's basically where we are. You know, that's, that's our latest report. <clears throat> well, the latest thing is we're trying to get a meeting with the actual state elected officials, Henry Stern, Richard Bloom, and um, Van Allen, who 
you know, essentially represent the respective school districts, have a meeting with them and the two negotiating teams so that everybody can kind of be on the same sheet of music. Part of that is that we in Malibu understand, and maybe it's because we're elected officials and we deal with people in, up in the state and go up and see how the sausage factory works, uh, realize that it's not just something you can kind of throw in at the end after all the other details have been negotiated. And that was something that became evident, I think, that the, uh, the people on the other side of the table who are board members on a school district didn't quite realize that you got to get in your legislative effort as early as possible, and it's not an easy process. So that's what we're trying to facilitate uh, in the next week or so. It's not been finalized. I have a meeting with everybody. Essentially, let's not have any uh, miscommunication. Let's not have everybody understand. Let's have our state elected officials walk everyone through the process. And it's not a commitment on anybody's part. It doesn't, if it gets passed, it doesn't obligate Santa Monica or us to any of the particular unique fine print of any negotiated settlement that has worked out. It just removes an impediment that for the Santa Monica, what would become Santa Monica School District is essentially an understandable showstopper. So that's where we are and that's what all this is about right now. There are so many other aspects to this school separation thing that I will not go into detail because they're really uh, too complex and there's a long history for all of them. But this is just one major um, potential roadblock that we're trying to get rid of and that's what this, that's where we are and that's what this upcoming meeting will be all about. Thank you, Rick. Excellent summary. Um, and I'll just say, uh, We've been going back and forth with Santa Monica, um, and as Rick said, and as anybody who's following this knows, uh, one of the m very important items is the existing parcel tax, uh, which um, has no sunset clause. Um, so, like Rick said, we've been looking into special legislation to be able to continue it, and the Board of Agenda, uh, Santa Monica Malibu Unified, had it on their, um, excuse me, the Board of Education had it on their agenda last Thursday. Um, it was discussed, but not acted upon. Um, and there are some other items uh, that the Santa Monica uh, side is uh, asking for. And um, we are hoping that the Board of Ed agendizes this parcel tax special legislation again soon and uh, takes action on it. So um, that's what I have to say. And I do have uh, a letter or an email that I received uh, late today from school board president John Keene. I will read that. I'm not sure if there's any particular order this has to go in, uh, but we do have is this two public comments or one for four minutes? Craig Foster and Ryan Embry. Two, two separate public comments. Okay, we have two public comments, I guess, and then I read the letter from the board president. Okay, so first uh, Craig Foster and then Ryan Embry. Hi everybody, I'm Craig Foster. I'm Malibu's only school board member on the Santa Monica Malibu School Board. I have to say first, I've been watching this meeting all night and I am so unbelievably jealous watching five intelligent people working with a fantastic staff to make wise decisions through powerful positive discourse, like it's killing me. But thank you for being you guys and I'm really proud you're our city council. Um, Second thing, uh, apologies to council member Mullen for five hours waiting last Thursday night for an item that was both disappointing and short. Um, we should have moved that up. And I think the excuse was it wasn't deliberate, but I think in the chaos that it was, they messed up. But I hope that the next, hope and expect the next time you come back, they'll do a better job. But those were dog hours you spent there, and I'm so very sorry for that. Um, third thing, of course, I support this um, parcel tax measure. It's very smart, take it off the table move forward, it's an easy thing, and if nothing, 
eventuates, which I very much hope is not the case, but if nothing eventuates, nothing has changed. So there's no reason for either entity not to move forward with this, and I will do my best to help them move forward, although I should point out that their negotiating committee is made up of three Santa Monica members and does not include me, which also means that by the Brown Act, I am not allowed to comment or participate in this other than in public meetings, which is, um, I guess, makes it clear that they're not negotiating for the school district, they're negotiating for the future Santa Monica School District, otherwise I would be included. Um, the last thing is I can't tell you how grateful I am and the people of Malibu are for the fact that you guys have taken this on and taken this on so strongly. Um, with this budget uh, situation going on in Malibu uh, and Santa Monica, sorry, at SMMUSD, the pressures are higher than they've been in living memory, and that is forcing all of the issues that we've known into the open and in more problematic ways than they've ever been before. So the urgency of moving forward with this, other than the fact that we're all beyond crazy for not having gotten there already, the urgency is even more than it's always been in a post Woolsey environment, an environment where enrollment is shrinking. I should know better, I've got 30 seconds, good. Um, and um, so I, I, I guess what I would uh, suggest to you, obviously y'all know better than me, but I would suggest to continue to try to narrow those gaps and also to continue looking for alternatives to keep the conversation honest because in my observation of them for these 10 years, they're gonna keep trying to move the goalposts. So the more you can narrow the conversation and the more you can have alternatives, the better it's gonna be for the kids in Malibu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ryan Embry. I think this has been a 10 year, 10 year item, 11. I collected signatures the first time and the second time. The second time petered out, and there seemed to have been a change uh, in the mindset of the people who were petitioning with the signatures to just, they got talked out of it from somebody. Um, not sure if that was John Deasy, but that's about the era that I remember we started having problems. We, this factionalization was manufactured from Santa Monica, and the, at that point, that's when I knew that something was gonna to have to change and it was probably not gonna be amicable. We've been discussing, we even, I think, talked about charter schools. We would be in a better negotiating position now if we had some. Um, we got talked out of that too. This has been an unfortunate slow dance negotiation for 11 years. And every year that's gone by, Santa Monica has successfully used our property parcel taxes pretty much as they say it's fit. These delays have benefited one of the proposed entities and not the other, meaning not us in Malibu. And it's not always possible to have an uncontested divorce or an amicable divorce, especially when one party's on the take. So we don't need to appease the future Santa Monica School Board um, because the petition process exists for this new Malibu entity to petition the County Office of Education and the state agencies to make it happen. And we've been bamboozled into vectoring off and doing this negotiation. Well, let's see if we can get Santa Monica, I would call it the Business of Education Board to go, let us go nicely to recommend to the County Office of Education the split. And the only way that will ever happen is if they get the bigger piece of the pie. They get a 50 year um, alimony. And when I gave this speech at the Board of Education with John Seibert, I think um, Schuyler was there, um, the camera was on me, and I said, I think you want alimony. And Maria Leon Vasquez started to squirm and got all excited, and I just wish the camera had been looking at her. Because you could tell exactly from that moment on what we were going to face 
in our endeavor to become independent. And I hate to call out names, but this is the way it's happened, and I think you all know it. Um, but it's time that we stop the slow dance. We need to do a fast dance. We need to play hardball. And this is the correct way to do it with the legislation to clear that item. But it's not going to be over. It's going to need to continue. But I, the negotiating needs to be with the agencies that can grant the petition and no longer with the Santa Monica Board of Education. Thank you, Ryan. I'd like to say I heard every single word you said. Thank you for your comments. Um, in any negotiation, delays support the status quo. That's easy to see. Um, and it's true. We could go to LACO uh, without some kind of an agreement. Um, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, I don't, I, I can't, I can't guess right now. Um, but what I would like to do now is read the letter that I received today at 3.59 p.m. from School Board President John Keene. Um, dear Mayor Fair and Malibu City Council members, it had been my plan to be with you in person tonight, but I seem to be coughing a bit more than I'd like to be today, and in an abundance of caution, I think it's best I stay home. Besides being present to have the opportunity to answer any questions that you might ask, I also wanted to show up because showing up matters. It was nice to see Council Member Mullen at our meeting on Thursday, although I'm sure he wishes we had seen just a little bit less of him as it turned into a long evening for many of us, especially Rick. But my point is he showed up. He shared his opinion. He was positive and forward thinking, and this encourages me. I wanted to return the gesture by appearing tonight, and I am sorry that it is not happening. You will be discussing the proposed legislation to address the issue of Measure R, the parcel tax in Santa Monica and Malibu. The continuation of this measure is vital for the prospects of unification. Knowing that special legislation is an available solution to this is an available solution to this concern is certainly a relief to us on the school board. While I absolutely understand your desire to pass this legislation as soon as possible, I do want to reiterate the position of the school board, which is we would like to see the other outstanding items from our discussions addressed before asking legislators to get this item approved. If, as you have told us, we are very close and those items will not be difficult to wrap up, I urge you to get the school board that information so that we can then encourage our representatives in Sacramento to take up this task. I believe that we are finally within sight of the finish line for unification. I say that knowing full well that for many in this room tonight, the journey has been a long one, but I don't want to relitigate the past. I want to focus on the present, and in the present, we are ready to make this a reality. If we are as close to resolving the outstanding items as you have told us, let's get them done. We are all finally pulling in the same direction. Let's stay together, stay focused, and see it through. Thank you for your time and consideration tonight, John Keene. Um, <clears throat> yes, I was there for five hours, but you know, I have Kindle on my phone, and I, I've always wanted to start reading Bill Gates' biography, and I got a pretty darn good way through it while I was waiting there. So it's not a bad idea to bring your phone with the Kindle on it. Um, I will say this about, I just want to say this. It's an interesting, this of all the challenges that we have faced and wrestled with here from the city council, you know, and there have been some significant challenges and entities which it's been difficult to deal with. Um, this is 
as this unfolds and as we get further along, it gets more and more interesting to me. And it's quite engaging. And we have a very good staff and very good negotiators and our um, team of experts gets better all the time. And we get smarter as we go forward and we learn a lot. And it's, I'm the new kid on the block because I haven't been in neck deep in this like Karen and Craig and all the other um, monk people have been for years. So I'm, I'm much newer to the table, but uh, the further we go along, the more compelling and more interesting it is to me. And the more, the more I get toward uh, believing we're going to have a very positive outcome. And it, it's difficult. It's a difficult process, but this is just one step along the way. And it changed. Uh, when the city took it over, it, it changed the dynamic change. And I really want to thank the city manager and Christy Hogan for jumping into something that they had zero knowledge on by comparison to anybody, but provided the keys to really what's going forward. And Reva has been very good and very astute about dealing with um, the people on the other side of the table. And, and Christy, just by chance, her firm joined this other firm and they have this education attorney there who's been worth her weight in gold and she got us onto somebody else and we got a couple other people and as we move forward we're getting smarter and it's it's I find myself getting much more engaged this this is to me becoming like the numero uno priority and it's really very interesting so for all of you who've been involved for a thousand years um, I think we're getting better as we move forward Thank you, Rick. So, um, on our agenda here, we we are looking to endorse legislation that provides for the continuation of the Measure R parcel tax after separation of the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. Um, so. Do we have a motion for that? Yeah, I'll move to uh, support the recommended action. And I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. May I make a final additional comment to Craig for his efforts? Craig, thank you. Um, seeing you today at the library subcommittee meeting, now you know how tough it is, and now I see your plight and the additional gray hair you have earned. Thank you, sir, for your beneficial behavior to the, for the city. Yes. Thank you to Board Member Foster for his patience, wisdom, um, long suffering, and uh, continued. Fighting of the good fight. So, with that, um, I would like to move to adjourn in memory of Charles DeGarmo. And for, I see heads nodding. For uh, anyone who didn't know Mr. DeGarmo, he was a very, very long time Point Doom resident and very long time teacher at Malibu Park Junior High School and his uh, memorial services this weekend at the Malibu Midland High School campus. Uh, so do I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.